you are live now sir thank you very much and uh, we are here from aios scientific committee and today we have one of the most important and uh, a devil in this guys that we have to address the devil is there everywhere whether we do a good cataract surgery whether we do a good refractive surgery whether it is a uh, surgery with uveitic patient so the devil is always there and the devil is the, the dry eye so i have great pleasure in welcoming all our faculty members and uh, let me allow to quickly share the slides I think the slide share is uh, not coming on. So uh, I have we have with us uh, Dr. Videndra Sangwan, and sir is one of the doyens of Cornia, and uh, we request him to give his keynote address. And uh, the keynote address is on post-operative dry eye management. Sir, all yours, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Patu. And I like to thank all India Ophthalmic Society and the uh, scientific committee for. Uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, share my thoughts and uh, just let me are you able to see my slides yes Pardon? sir yes sir yes sir yes sir all right good evening again and uh, <clears throat> i'll briefly talk about the uh, dry eye um, post operatively just to give you a background about how the dry eye definition and the standardization happen over the years you know in 1992 the first international conference on lacrimal gland tear film and dry eye syndromes were organized and then you know the major was tfos uh, dues workshop and that was started in 2004 and then uh, 2007 they published their first report and then we started uh, dues 2 in 2015 and published reports in 2017 the primary objective of that was to update the definition classification etc and the main objective was to standardize the definitions because the reporting of dry eye and its symptoms and its outcomes is very important that we all follow the same system so major change was in the definition the dues 1 definition is above and dues 2 is defined uh, they defined dry eye as multifactorial disease of ocular surface uh, characterized by loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms and uh, instability of the uh, ocular tear film hyperosmolarity ocular surface inflammation and damage and neurosensory uh, abnormalities play etiological role you know i was part of the steering committee and the amount of time we spent in just standardizing and agreeing on the wording of the definition it took tremendous effort and this was the first meeting we had in san francisco uh, as a steering co committee members 15 from different part of the world and a total of 150 clinician basic scientist industry experts participated in in this and there were uh, uh, 10 11 sub committees which uh, worked on different aspects uh, i worked at that time on hydrogenic dry eye and i am today uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, post operative is one of the hydrogenic uh, causes so uh, when we do surgeries uh, there there is sometimes known unknown factors like when we do such extensive surgeries on the ocular surface um, we normally don't encounter a dry eye so, see we do extensive dissection of the corneal uh, surface epithelium subepithelial plexus conjunctiva but i haven't seen a uh, uh, dry eye case in these patients but it is known that the uh, hydrogenic eye dry eye can be due to contact lens topical systemic medications and variety of surgeries that some of them we will discuss today uh, the pathophysiology of um, the um, post operative dry eye is not very clear but there can be risk factors there can be undiagnosed pre existing conditions there can be pre intra and post operative factors once the dry eye sets in the cascade of events is uh, exactly the same 
my idea of showing this uh, video is that this is such an extensive uh, surface surgery, yet you do not see the dry eye post-operatively. On the other hand, you do a LASIK, you do PRK, uh, you would, uh, in certain patients, you will uh, encounter symptoms. So, you know, understanding the pathophysiology, the mechanisms is still a very gray area. In the ocular uh, induced two, we came up with the variety of these factors that, uh, you know, uh, pre-operatively there can be the, uh, factors like which are listed here, the intraoperative factors, especially one should pay attention to pre-operative medication, which are used uh, for dilatation, if they are preserved to three or not, not too many medicine, not too often. And then post-operatively, I think the most important uh, problem I see is too many medications used by surgeons. I generally use only a steroid antibiotic, uh, antibiotic for a week and then steroids for four to six weeks. There can be, uh, you know, predisposing factors or unrecognized uh, conditions like blepharitis, mibomitis, which may be very subtle preoperatively, but if not paid attention to or if not addressed, that can be a problem. So before any surgery, pay attention to these areas because it's very well known uh, for coronary and external disease expert that blepharitis is an important uh, cause of dry eye in the routine clinic and it's grossly underdiagnosed, underappreciated and undertreated. Similarly, bibomitis is another common problem because these uh, surgeries we generally do in elderly, most of the surgeries, and in those patients you invariably have underlying bibomitis and if it's not treated, again, that will create a problem postoperatively. Another aspect, defective spreading the tear film. This can be a due to a small note in the tear, uh, in the lid margin. There can be variety of other abrasions and there can be, uh, you know, um, uh, blink abnormalities. So many uh, factors that needs to, uh, you know, go into in assessing patient preoperatively. The lid surgery is very common. Again, underappreciated, underdiagnosed uh, cause of dry eye and all these reasons, which I mentioned here, listed here, these are the risk factor for uh, development of dry eye following lid surgeries. Blepharoplasty is another um, surgery which is common and also causes uh, uh, dry eye. And therefore, in the immediate post-op period, exposure is a major, major uh, uh, issue that needs to be taken care of. In the management of uh, in, in uh, following blef uh, this blepharoplasty, I think one should just follow the usual uh, medical treatment. And if it is uh, not uh, addressed to, then the oviculoplastic surgeon should uh, uh, plan or redo the surgery. There is another common, relatively common, not very common, but conjunctive oclasis in old elderly people. Uh, where there is a loose pons which uh, affects the mm, lid margin and the preocular tear film, and that can disturb the distribution of the preocular tear film. And in mild diseases, you may be able to, uh, mild degree of con conjunctive oclasis, you may be able to control with steroid and restasis, but uh, in moderate to severe disease, you will need conjunctive resection along with the amniotic membrane. So these are other uh, surgeries where there is a some postulation of the mechanism like keratoplasty, conjunctile surgery, glaucoma surgery, VR surgery, strabismus surgery. And these things are, uh, we had covered extensively in the DUES 2 report. There was a particular uh, section on hydrogenic dry eye. So I encourage uh, those who are listening to refer to uh, the DUES 2 report uh, for the detailed reading. One thing that all of us should understand, whether it is a dry eye in a patient without surgery or post-operatively, the inflammation sets in and that inflammation then drives the instability of the tear film and leads to hyperosmolarity. And so irrespective of the underlying cause, inflammation is the driving factor. And therefore, the generic treatment would consist of uh, some sort of uh, you know, pulse topical steroids, immunomodulatory agents like cyclosporine, and then uh, LFA, this is an adhesion molecule which blocks LFA ICAM interaction on the epithelial cells. And uh, these are uh, sort of uh, expressed in the inflammatory situation. So these are some of the treatments that may be very helpful when you encounter, but uh, the main emphasis should be the prevention of the 
um, uh, disease and recognizing the underlying factors. The areas of future um, research, which I think is that this is an area of dry eye that we don't understand much. And uh, as I mentioned that, you know, in LASIK and PRK patients, we may see more severe uh, dry eye. Where on the other hand, when we do a conjectile surgery or a corneal surface surgery, we don't see unless you do a penetrating gyroplasty. So the research should be focused in that direction and it should be clinician driven. Then only we'll, we'll find some uh, uh, solution to these problems. And use of medication, excessive, too many medications should be avoided. In conclusion, the hydrogenic dry eye disease may be caused by topical or systemic uh, medications, surgical procedures, and uh, use of different uh, agents you, you used in the surgery. So therefore, appropriate before and after uh, interventions are necessary and uh, use uh, medications without preservative as far as possible if you are using the medicines more than four times a day. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Samar Pasak sir is here. So uh, Pasak sir, uh, your comments, your views. And, uh, no, no, after the, after the <laughs> keynote address, I, I should not comment anything. Shangwan is excellent and he has covered all the aspect of rather prevention is more important than uh, treating a post-operative dry eye. That is the key keynote uh, message to the uh, common uh, ophthalmologist. Sir, I think a very basic question that we miss is uh, the importance of the uh, steroids in dry eye treatment. I think, uh, you know, as lay people, we need to know that when to give the steroid and when not to give the steroid. When the steroid has to be instituted and uh, when it can be avoided. If the, if the dry eye, for whatever reasons, if it is moderate to severe, and how do you know it is moderate to severe? There are different grading uh, systems, there are uh, uh, the OSDI scores and other things. But what I follow is, number one, the patient symptom, number two, the uh, surface staining, either lysamine green or rose bengal. I uh, mostly uh, do rose bengal and the portion staining. And if I find that the patient symptom and the epithelial abnormalities match. In those patients, uh, initially, I'll give uh, topical steroid for four to six weeks. And when you are seeing the patient for the first time, or you are seeing uh, as a referred from your colleague, I would like to give them uh, the topical steroids along with lubricants. And if it is an underlying disease, say, for example, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, or if you have SJS or if you have GVHD and you know so many other causes, then I may uh, direct my treatment specifically to address those problems as well. And steroids should be used as a pulse dose, uh, you know, used for four to six weeks uh, in tapering uh, doses. And by that time, the surface can be rescued and use other uh, agents to improve the uh, functionality. Rish, sir. Yeah, uh, uh, I yeah, agree with uh, Virender as far as the use of steroids is concerned, that it is not something that we should run away from or be scared about. But uh, um, uh, typically, uh, if I'm dealing with an equus deficient dry eye, uh, most of these patients, I would put the patients, because I'm a great fan of cyclosporin topical. So I would put the patients on topical cyclosporin and I would put them on two to three weeks of steroids in the initial phase so that the burning stinging is less. And we know that the cyclosporin takes time. I may not continue for six weeks. Six weeks, I would do four to six weeks in an unknown etiology, the, the sort of mixed picture where I'm not sure. Then, and, and a patient who's extremely unhappy has gone to four or six doctors and they've just been changing the brand names of the lubricants. So then I would put the patient, as Virendra says, on a tapering dose for four to six weeks of the steroid and ask them to stick with a particular lubricant and to stick with me for those four to six weeks till the steroids are on. So these are the uh, indications for me where I would use steroids for a prolonged period. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Another very practical question, you know, all of us are faced with is uh, the uh, 
the uh, the cyclosporines per se uh, we have the indigenous ones and we have the ones that are you know uh, that have come up uh, and have been there for a very long time uh, manufactured by uh, the mncs so do you think that between the cyclosporines uh, one is of course the percentage of cyclosporine no, next is the uh, brand of cyclosporine do they really matter is it okay to give the indigenous brands and is it uh, uh, or would you rely more on the mnc brands yeah i, I think the there is def definitely there may be some difference in the quality and the uh, availability of the uh, medication but now uh, what i depend more of um, is tacrolimus i ointment so and those these are both most most of the indian uh, most are indian brands and they are not very expensive and uh, dosing wise and convenience so yeah. at that time you say uh, the tacrolimus and i am finding that they are very very helpful so restasis is reserved for people you know who have uh, chronic uh, you know moderate to severe dry due to kcs for professionals and uh, for those who can afford easily i would uh, uh, use for them but uh, the indian uh, brands of cyclosporin uh, particularly i don't have any liking for one or the other i would uh, now practically 80% of the time switch to uh, tacrolimus okay sir uh, as far as uh, cyclosporin is concerned yes restasis is the uh, uh, um, the first one out in the market and the uh, elegant study which was there um which showed consult they did try 0 0.0 you know the higher percentage 0.1% as opposed to 0 0.05 and they found that there is not much difference so the 0 0.05 is what i would use i i have never used the higher concentration it seems to be a sort of cross between the highest that is 2% which i would use for allergy and uh, this so it, it doesn't really help me so i would use the regular 0.05% the Indian brands, I, I now find some of them are coming up to the mark. They're doing well, especially those with the nanocellular technology, where they're using uh, the nanocellular particles. So the penetration is a little uh, better and comparable to the market leader. So again, again, no particular uh, choice, but uh, if a patient can't afford, I would put them, but, and the prices have also gone up. So they're they, they're not very cheap anymore. So uh, I agree with Virendra that Tacrolimus is by far the cheapest. It costs about 100 rupees or so uh, and lasts for about a month as opposed to at least 500 rupees for any brand of uh, cyclosporin for a month's supply. Partha, can I just make a comment on it? Yes, please. Just, just yes, one please. comment. We have used 1% for dry eye because we got it made in our pharmacy and... Uh, uh, we did not find that there was too much of a difference between, you know, uh, the the commercial brand that is available and the higher concentration in dry eye. But we use topical two percent for graft rejections, and Perfect. that, yeah. yeah. So, so if you go ahead, and also we've used it for uh, for topical one percent uh, for VKC allergy. Exactly, that's exactly what I do. Yeah. For those, it has uh, it makes a difference, but for Dry eye, I don't think you need to go higher. I completely agree with Dr. Sangwan that tacrolimus is a cheaper and a better alternative. Dr. Right. Sangwan, can I, may I ask a question, Dr. Partha? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. I have please, found please. that in my practice, uh, a lot of patients who end up complaining of watering and irritation in the eye after cataract surgery, especially, are people who have a small amount of uh, conjunctival chalysis. And if we don't pay attention to that, I feel that is the one which troubles you often after yeah. surgery. It seems to get worse in patients who've been using preserved drops. So I feel preserved post-operative drops, especially if you're using lots of them, and con uh, missed conjunctival chalysis seem to be the two main things which cause, uh, uh, which uh, I feel post-operative unhappiness, these two, if you mm -hmm. take care of, I think, in my practice, yes, I think... Yeah, absolutely true. Conjectival place is grossly underdiagnosed. So, if we just look for it and treat it at the time of surgery, it's so much easier, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rishi. 
So, uh, shall we go over? Uh, I just would like to formally introduce our speakers and our, uh, of course, uh, the first thing that I have to say is I'm indebted to the Governing Council of AIOS for their everlasting support and uh, support in every way that we have all our webinars as well as the AIOC 2021 that we had. And uh, Dr. Barun Naik, sir, Dr. Lalit Verma, Dr. Harvind Shlal, Dr. Maipal would be joining in very shortly, Dr. Namrata, Dr. Rajesh is going to join in quite soon, Santosh, Arup, Chitra, thank you very much for being around. And uh, we have our wonderful scientific committee team, Amit Porwal, Farooz, Jatinder Bhalla, Krishna Prashad Kudlu, Parikshit, Somshila, and Sonu. And they make up a very, very strong team and help us in every way. Uh, Harban Slal sir is our chairperson and uh, director of Delhi Eye Center, vice president of AIOS and co-chairman department of ophthalmology, Sir Gagan Ram Hospital, and is also the chairman and department of the CME. Maipal sir, uh, immediate past president AIOS, chairman scientific committee IRSI, chairman managing director of center for sight group of eye hospitals. Sir is going to join in uh, in a little while. Dr. Samar Basak sir, Director and Senior Consultant, Ornia, Dishai Hospitals in Kolkata. Dr. Kuresh Muskati, sir, uh, Director and Senior Consultant, Ornia, Muskati Eye Clinic in Mumbai. Uh, Professor Namrata Sharma, Secretary AIOS and Professor of Ophthalmology, Cataract Cornea and Refractive Services, RP Center, Ames, Delhi. Thank you very much, Namrata, for joining in despite your very, very busy schedule in the DOS. Uh, Professor Rajesh Sinha, Treasurer AIOS and Professor of Ophthalmology, Cataract, Cornea and Refractive Services, AIMS. And uh, thanks, Rajesh, for coming in. Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy, Chairperson of ARC and Medical Director of Eye Foundation in Coimbatore. 13 hospitals, of course, spread over all over the eastern and uh, the southern India. And uh, we had Dr. Virendra Sangwan and Sirs. Huge biodata is more than anything else, but the credit is for the sprawling 27 years of his love, devotion to cornea and anterior segment that he has. And uh, we are really, really grateful to Sir for all his uh, publications, for all the teachings he has provided over so many years. Thank you very much, Sangman Sir, for being with us. Rishi is our, uh, one of our speakers, medical director and senior consultant at Cornea, uh, uh, in Cornea, Swarup Eye Center in Hyderabad. And Pragya Rao, we have as a consultant, Cornea and Interior Segment, Cataract and Refractive at LVPI, Hyderabad. Thank you, Pragya, for joining in. Dr. P Parul Ichapujani, Associate Professor of Glaucoma Neuroophthal Services in the Department of Ophthalmology, Government Medical College Hospital in Chandigarh. We have seen Parul's wonderful department and the wonderful services that she provides. Dr. Narin Shetty, Head of Department of Cataract and Refractive Services at, and Vice Chairman of Narayan Netralaya Bangalore. Thanks, Narin, for being here. Rishi Mohan, Senior cornea and cataract and refractive consultant at MMI Tech Institute in Delhi. And we have also consultant UVR specialist, cataract surgeon at Intralem, super specialty eye care in Kolkata, Anand Kishore Majumdar. Thank you very much, all of you, for being with us today. So we come to uh, Parul. I think uh, Parul uh, wanted to uh, <coughs> speak next. And uh, Parul, you can uh, be there. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, AIOS Scientific Committee, for having me. I'll be talking about dry eye following glaucoma medications and surgery. So as the theme picture was, there are horns on the eye, and it's pretty much a devil which is there. And I guess it's Halloween all around for glaucoma patients, all around the year for glaucoma patients, because they have to have chronic medications and eventually laser and 
uh, glaucoma surgery. So usually when we look at our patients in glaucoma clinic, we are looking at the intraocular pressure, we look at the optic nerve head, we look for notching, we look for any retinal nerve fiber layer defects, and we see if the visual fields and OCT parameters are deteriorating. But often we forget to make note of subtle uh, dry eye findings, which eventually become very prominent. And the patient is likely to become non-compliant with medications if they have an itchy, pokey eye, which wasn't there when they were not putting the medications. And we need to remember that at least 45 to 60% of our patients are using glaucoma eye drops. They have an ocular surface disease. And the severity of the ocular surface disorder increases when we increase number of medications without tailor making the prescription. And when we substitute multiple brands, as was suggested by Dr. Sangwan, the excipients and buffers, they change and they create a havoc in the eye. The dry eye disease, the dysfunctional tear syndrome, or the ocular surface disorder, they are very conservatively described in literature as regards glaucoma because some of the post-trabeculectomy patients, they have discordance between the dry eye disease signs and symptoms, and some of the visual symptoms, which are a manifestation of dry eye disease, are overlapping with glaucoma. So you don't really know what are the which visual symptoms to assign to either of the two uh, diseases. So dry eye diseases, disease versus ocular surface disorder, I would say that DED is a part of the OSD spectrum. So we don't really need to go into too much nitty gritty of that, but just understand that the surface is the one that is getting compromised with multiple medications and eventually with surgery. And these multiple medications are going to influence the success or failure of your surgery. So two things to remember, Multiple medications and dry eye, whether pre-existing in the glaucoma patients, results in increased osmolarity of the tear film and inflammation of the ocular surface, as was mentioned in the previous talk as well. Now, most of us don't use clinical parameters to assess. Uh, most of us don't use any objective parameters to assess the osmolarity, but the inflammatory signs on the ocular surface are quite prominent if the patient is on long-term therapy. So the factors that result in post-operative dry eye disease in glaucoma patients are, of course, just like any other, age, the hormonal changes, and more prominently in women who are postmenopausal, uh, an air-conditioned environment. If you are sitting in ACs throughout the summers and have blowers on in the winters, it really makes a mess out of the ocular surface. Multiple topical medications, the ones which are with preservatives are definitely the devil. Uh, other coexistent systemic diseases, autoimmune diseases, myobomin gland dysfunction, which is often, often ignored by many of us, and an additional ocular surgery, even if it is an innocuous cataract surgery. So we overlook the signs often. So in a new patient, when we are assessing for glaucoma, we need to look for baseline OSD, as importantly as the intraocular pressure and the optic nerve head changes. And in our follow patients, all signs of allergy, be it conjunctival hyperemia, chemosis, or periorbital arrhythmia are to be taken care of, noted, and definitely addressed to. Punctate epithelial erosion. So we often don't stain the conjunctival surface and look at what is happening. But that's a practice that I've recently started doing and I've realized that that has made me change my therapy for a lot of my patients. Even filamentary keratitis and areolar punctate keratitis is seen in many. Lead margins, poor lead margins, I would rather say. They have myobomin gland dysfunction and they have telangiectatic changes. And we often forget to see the lid function. So blink rate and a possible like lag of thermos is there if patient is on multiple medications for very, very long time. So this is one of my patients. She was a 70 year old lady who had open angle glaucoma and was on maximal therapy. And she came several times with persistent discharge and itching. And one of my residents initially thought that she had conjunctivitis. So she added on a, a gatifloxus and eye drop, but that obviously did not work. And when I saw the patient and I realized that, you know, no drug is a saint and I need to really give this patient a break from all the ocular medications. And once the patient had a drug holiday, she reverted back to normal. So just remember that people say that brimonidine is the most notorious one, but all the drugs, mind you, all the drugs have a component of allergy related to them. 
Yet another patient, a 65 year old male was allergic to almost all the drugs. So I would just stop one and rest, uh, start a new one. And every time I would end up with a dry eye crusting and blepharitis. So I just thought that, you know, there is no point playing around with the drugs and it's time to consider surgery, although the glaucoma wasn't advanced enough. But the patient had borne the brunt and they realized that, you know, they needed the surgery. And who are the culprits in this scenario? Are they just the preservators or the active ingredients or both? That is an answer which, you know, really there is no concrete answer to. And in addition to preservatives, most of us don't even see the excipients and buffers that are there in the drug and that also contribute to the dry eye. So this was one of the studies uh, of dry eye disease in patients with functioning filtering blebs after trabeculectomy, and they found that the bleb height and the presence of microcysts, they were the, um, you know, sort of negative uh, factors for uh, dry eye disease in patients with filtering bleb. But we have always been taught that, you know, having microcysts is something which is very good for the glaucoma patients after the surgery. So what happens when we have multiple microcysts is there is an absence of mucin, especially the gel forming mucin, which is the MUC5AC. And in addition to that, there is an irregular in thickness and numeral intraepithelial microcysts. That leads to reduction of the normal goblet cells. And the abnormal goblet cells that are there, they usually correspond to the location of microcyst and they make matters worse. If the bleb height is quite high, that may interfere with the lid function and definitely the distribution of the tear film on the ocular surface and tear film instability ultimately may lead to corneal epithelial defects or conjunctival uh, uh, dishealth. The small bleb corneal angle can induce tear film instability uh, itself. So if you have a very bulbous small bleb, which is usually seen if there is a, a ring of steel in the limbal based bleb. So this high bleb has a small bleb corneal angle and that can result in discomfort. Now, GDD is not much is reported about them. This is one of my patients of uh, the earlier times when I was doing, when I just started doing Adi and the bleb was so bulbous and the patient ended up with a delin like keratopathy. So, you know, none of the surgeries, none of the medications is foolproof. You just have to keep a close watch. Uh, Dr. Sangwan had just shown in his slide that uh, laser therapy has been advocated to save the eye as long as possible from the um, adverse effects of the medications. But in India, most of the patients, once you have done a laser, they feel that you know the glaucoma is cured and they don't really get back to you. So that is something that has to be drilled into their heads that you, know, you have to come for regular follow-ups. So how to address the issue? We give artificial tears, preservative-free or always, always welcome. The other medications also to be switched to preservative-free. Cyclosporine, as we mentioned, can be added if you have telltale signs of conjunctival uh, inflammation, which can be there in the form of you know, some small tortuosity on the conjunctival vessels, worm compressors if you have meibomian gland dysfunction, lid scrubbing, oral doxy, omega-3 fatty acids, punctal plugs. Some of the studies have cited use of these plugs, but you know they act as a double-edged sword. So in the end, I would just conclude with the statement that no notice is taken of a little evil, but when it strikes, it really makes a mess of the eye. So that is something we have to keep in mind when we are treating our glaucoma patients, be it with medications or with surgery. Thank you so much. Um, I cannot hear you, ma'am. Chitra, ma'am, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for a wonderful talk and I enjoyed every bit of it. Partha should be joining in anytime soon. There's some network problem. Uh, but having said all that you did, we have so many patients of glaucoma with four medications and all, but you know, they, they, do, they don't seem to have dry eyes in spite of the fact that they're using all these medicines with their preservatives on. And it's just suddenly you come see a patient with a flare up, it's then you realize that primodine has been there in it. So compared to the, the amount of volume of drops we put into the eye, don't you think that uh, the ocular surface disease should have been humongous in glaucoma patients? And have you ever wondered that it is not as severe as it should be because they are on medicine every day of their lives? Ma'am, I would still say that it is quite humongous because the subtle changes are always there. I mean, if we are talking about very significant ones, which the patient will come to you with 
you know, a dire uh, need to address the issue, they are definitely less. But if you closely observe, the ocular surface is crying for help after a year or two of medications. So those subtle changes are visible and uh, they definitely compromise the success of your trabeculectomy or the drainage implant, which you would eventually do. So addressing that, and as you say, multiple medications, now a lot of times, when you see the prescriptions that people are getting, so they have a brimonidine chemolol combination, they have a separate dorsolamide, they have a separate prostaglandin. So unless they tailor make the uh, medication in a way that you have a prostaglandin timolol combination and a brinzolamide brimonidine together, so you reduce the frequency of drugs and eventually the effect of preservatives, which the rest of them would have brought in with them, uh, that those small little steps, they uh, do wonders for a long-term therapy. So I guess we really have to be more vigilant for the subtle signs before it really becomes, you know, too pronounced to um, cause discomfort. Yeah, I would now invite Dr. Amit and then Dr. Jatinder uh, Valla to bring out some salient facts in her wonderful talk. Dr. Amit, are you there? Amit is not there. Dr. Jatinder? Yeah, ma'am. I'm yeah. joining. Yeah. Nay, it was a very nice talk by Dr. Parul. As rightly pointed, uh, the subtle changes are always there in uh, the patients of glaucoma who are on long-term anti-glaucoma medications. It is that uh, all the patients don't complain and we routinely don't see them on Stetlam and don't do conjunctival staining. We did a thesis where we did the impression cytology of the conjunctiva and we found that the incidence of dry eye was very significant particularly in the, and it was significant in patients on uh, the beta blockers. It was significant in patients on alpha agonists like brimonidin. And it was even there with uh, patients using prostaglandin eye drops. So uh, rightly pointed out that no drug is saint. Every drug causes, and particularly when these patients are on long-term anti-glaucoma medications, the surface changes are significant. And they do affect uh, not only symptomatically these patients, even the surgical results when they are, are the surgery is undertaken at a later stage, the surgical results are also affected. No, Chitra, you do their lip view and you do their ocular surface analysis, there are definite changes. Then the Bowman glands are truncated, uh, if you see them long term. So there are definite changes. It is only that they are not complaining, they are probably on lubricants and they've not crossed that threshold that we don't, you know, come to know. I was just trying to compare them with our refractive surgery patients. So I, I somehow feel that nerve transaction which happens in these uh, procedures, the amount of uh, issues, neuropathic pain or everything which happens, epithelial breakdown, all those things are more than in glaucoma when they are using so many medicines. We tend to add one more uh, lubricant to them and sometimes we don't because we are so worried that they should not stop the main medications too. So I was trying to compare them as against our refractive surgery patients whose eye look quiet, but they are so disturbed with it. No, no, so but the, the, the difference between refractive surgery patients and these are that refractive surgery patients, they would still regenerate the nerves and that regeneration would happen within a year. But uh, glaucoma patients, it's only downhill for them. It cannot be, you know, reparative processes or procedures are not uh, that robust for them. That is the only thing. Exactly. And, and they have additional systemic diseases like diabetes and all. They all compound to the uh, problem and the issues of no, no. dry eyes. I wasn't so saying they don't have dry eyes. I said they are on medicines all through the years. For that, they come smiling into your room and they're comfortable. If you sit and put all of them through the battery of dry eye tests, I'm sure 60, 50 plus majority would have. It's just that so that is exactly what we are doing. All yeah. our glaucoma patients, Dr. Tanuj is actually doing a study, is getting ocular surface analysis and lip view for every patient. So that is what I'm saying. more worried about their vision and their glaucoma than they are worried about a little bit of symptoms. So right. that's the reason they don't complain. Once yeah. you've got something serious in your hand, you really don't bother about these smaller things in your life. Yeah. So this that's is probably that's, that's the reason they don't really complain so much. So yes. they're, they're Sorry, not really it's complaining. The is early. When the disease is early, the visual symptoms are not there. They will not complain. Sir, but when they are, yeah, when, I completely agree with Parul. No, no, the fear when of glaucoma. When they are, when they are uh, glaucoma following is up for 20 plus years, then they will complain. Yes. No, no, no. Fear of glaucoma itself, all of them uh, go and search in Google, uh, go into the YouTube and they know what glaucoma is. 
and they are really quite scared of they might become blind. So they are no, more worried about whether their eyes are all right or not. So probably that's the reason they don't complain as much as the other patients who complain about the dry eye symptoms. I think uh, may, may I just, may, may I just in spite add, of in spite of so many of medications. They really never complain why you added so many medicines and for so many years and then you follow up them so many because so many times now they're really worried about their eyesight more than anything else. Uh, Chitra, may I just add yes. that, that, that sometimes the fault lies with our glaucoma specialists also because uh, the, the poor patient when he goes to complain about any stickiness or discharge or pain or redness, He's poor and he's told by the glaucoma specialist that you, you know, I'm preventing you from going blind and you're all worried about little foreign no, body I sensation. Think, I, I don't think we are glaucoma section, we are sort of become <laughs> relatives of these patients because they come twice or thrice a year over years. So their 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 symptoms of dryness are downplayed by the ocular by the glaucoma specialist. I have seen this happening. Then they come out to us, cornea people, and then tell us that I told this. To my glaucoma specialist, I've been telling her since five years, but she never listened. You know, so I've heard this complaint quite Sorry. often. I'm not, I'm not bringing down any speciality. I'm just saying that this is also a truth. Yeah. Yeah. So now the glaucoma specialist should refer all his patients to the ocular surgeon. No, no, no. They don't specialist. have to refer her once. They can manage it themselves. But I'm just saying, that <laughs> give the patient some some credence for his symptoms. Yeah. How many? How much of the uh, trabeculectomy surgical failures could be uh, attributed to the dry eyes and the inflammatory markers which are, which increase and we if we see any uh, failing bleb we become even more aggressive with needling and mitomycin and all that how many of us have actually thought of treating the dry eye status you know those kind of thoughts came to my mind so I brought it up I'm sure you may have something to add before we go on to our next speaker Dr. Rishi Anything to add, Dr. Parul? Yes. Um, you know, a lot of times when uh, immediately the post-operative course, say around week three, when the teen insist or, uh, you know, uh, it's starting to form, there is so much of inflammation and there is a cytokine storm that is happening, which is making the dry eye worse and that's not addressed to. So yeah. in uh, my practice where I picked up from Dr. Spaeth that if you give endomethacin when the cytokine storm is strong, you take care of the inflammation, the bleb settles down, and all those associated inflammatory element for the dry eye also settles down. So those subtle changes of corkscrewing of conjunctival blood vessels and changes in the tenons, you know, the changes which come with the cytokine peak need to be addressed to resolve all these issues. So with that, I would just like to yes. conclude. I'm, uh, yes. Can I yes. just make one comment? Yes, yes. Dr. Shetty. Yeah, uh, I just want to, I mean, since everyone's discussing why, you know, glaucoma patients, sometimes they're, you know, so long drops, they'll, uh, they don't realize the symptoms and this one, I, I truly feel that it's more of a gradual process of the side effect. But in terms of surgery, it is a drastic, it's a sudden insult to the eye. So the patient realizes yesterday and today. But in drops, uh, when you put long term drops, the side effects slowly crop in. So I feel that could be one of the factors why the patients don't realize the slow cropping nature. But at one point, definitely, they start feeling the symptoms of, uh, you know, uh, the dry eyes and other things. But, you know, since it's a gradual process, uh, you know, not all people do tend in the early stage. So and we shall, uh, thanks a lot for the great discussion. We shall now go on to Dr. Rishi Swaroo. I'm sure he's going to come up with something brilliant as far as cornea and dry eye is concerned. Look forward to your case discussions, Rishi. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the mandate given to me by Dr. Partha was to give a, share a couple of cases of um, dry eye in corneal disease. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. It's not uh, much of a didactic talk. And then we can have a discussion later um, as has been discussed. So uh, this is my first case. It was a 10-year-old male uh, boy uh, who presented with... Um, his known case of an allergic conjunctivitis. He presented uh, with itching, watering, discharge, and redness more in the right eye than the left eye, with recurrent episodes of inflammation since two years. He also gave a history of chicken pox followed by mouth ulcers two years ago when all of this started and was using lubricant drops when he came to me in the clinic. His vision was six by 18 in the right eye and left eye was uh, normal vision and um, objective refraction could not be done as he was very symptomatic. 
so on examination, he had keratinization of the lid margin um, with papillae, uh, lots of papillae in the upper tarsal conjunctiva. Cornea, I'll just show you. And rest of the anterior segment was within normal limits. So this is how his right eye was looking. He had, um, it's like a shield also like appearance with um, a plaque on the uh, cornea with lots of staining of the cornea, as you can see here. And you can see when we inverted the uh, lids, you could see that the tarsal conjunctiva was very inflamed with lots of papillae, thickened uh, conjunctiva. And you can see this keratinization at the lid margin, both in the upper and the lower tarsal uh, uh, conjunctiva and the lid margin. This was his left eye. Even the left eye showed a lot of papillary reaction and there was a little bit of keratinization at the, in the center of the lids in both more in the upper lid and slightly in the lower lid. The tear film breakup time was eight and seven uh, in right and left eye and Shermer's was normal. So I made a diagnosis of shield ulcer in the right eye and a combination of a Steven Johnson syndrome and a chronic vernal keratoconjunctivitis in this particular case. So I felt that both the conditions pre-existed. A patient was, in addition to lubricant drops, was put in topical cyclosporin and corticosteroids in the right eye. And a patient was planned for plaque debridement with amniotic membrane graft and mucous membrane graft in the right eye. So. Um, some people could uh, argue that this was the mucous membrane graft was a bit of an overkill, but um, I wasn't sure whether uh, this was contributing to his corneal condition also. And since we were anyway putting this child through GA, I decided that we can go ahead and do a little bit of mucous membrane graft as well. So we did do that and uh, we kind of excised the keratinized lid margin and replaced it with buccal mucous membrane uh, with the lip labial mucous membrane and uh, also put amniotic membrane graft on the cornea. You can see after some time, the cornea cleared up very nicely, uh, leaving behind a mild scar in the area where the shield ulcer was existing and uh, the lead margin became very healthy and the tarsal conjunctiva quietened down quite nicely. And uh, this is how the patient was in the subsequent uh, months. You can see that the lower lid was not touched. We did leave behind that little bit of keratinization in the uh, lower lid. I didn't want to do an extensive surgery and prolong the surgical time. That's why we left the lower lid as it is because it was not in the, not in the center, it was to the side. And I didn't feel it was contributing much to the corneal condition. And over time, the patient actually did quite well. You can see the lid margin almost became like a normal lid and uh, the corneal, cornea became wet and healthy and uh, lost all, uh, only, except for the scar, there was no staining of the cornea. There was a, a lot of residual astigmatism from the scar, of course, uh, and the patient did improve to 612 with um, uh, subjective correction, but otherwise uh, the surface was very healthy and uh, it became very quiet after a long time. And you can see uh, even on staining, there was nothing much. So this, this, these are just subsequent pictures. So from that condition, we kind of came to this from the left to the right. And, um, uh, the patient did well. So this was uh, <clears throat> the reason I'm presenting this here is because it was a VKC, not VCK, com complicated by SGS. Um, should the MMG in the lower lid also have been done? Was the MMG at all necessary? These are questions uh, which are up for debate. And um, should we be addressing the astigmatism or should I just leave this eye as it is? Should I present my other case or shall we discuss this first? Uh, we can, can go to your next case also. Uh, yeah, the second case is very quick. I'll just quickly present it. Sorry. Yeah, so this was uh, another patient of SGS actually. She was a 40 year old school teacher that came to me in 2011. Uh, she was diagnosed already as a case of SGS by a local ophthalmologist, had already undergone mucous membrane graft in, for the lid margin in the left eye. And because she was moving to Hyderabad, uh, the primary surgeon had referred to me. She had pretty good vision when she came to me, but with, came with complaints of pricking and pain in the left eye since a few days. And when I saw her, uh, the, there was a mucous membrane graft, not OU, OS uh, in the left eye, in the upper lid. Uh, she had clear cornea in the right eye with few SPKs, but the left eye, she showed this kind of a focal infiltrate with a lot of SPKs around it. Shermers was four millimeters in the right eye and two millimeters in the left eye. So I thought this was a secondary infection because of epithelial breakdown, treated her with preservative-free lubricants and antibiotics, 
and over time the infiltrate dissolved leaving behind a scar with some thinning after that the patient was maintained on preservative free lubricants uh, eventually the eye the cornea quieted down and the eye also quieted down but, but the patient had lots of symphysis and phonicial changes etc and uh, of course uh, the lid margin keratinization was there uh, as you can see in the pictures in the uh, left eye and in the right eye had a mmg in place now in between the patient was lost to follow up with me and went back to the primary surgeon uh, who performed a deep lamellar keratoplasty for the central scar that she had developed in the left eye also with there was an element of ectasia which which was there so the, the patient after going undergoing the surgery came back to me and she came to me with complaints of pain watering and pricking in the left eye the deep lamellar keratoplasty was done in the left eye which is always the worst eye and um, she had a vision of 6 by 18 in the left eye and when i looked at her this is how the left eye was uh, looking the mmg was well in place but, but the graft as you can see was clear centrally but uh, on one side there was a large epithelial defect and there was a haze in the graft and eventually this I, i don't have pictures after this but the patient actually had a very bad course the graft went on to melt and there was an interface uh, exudation and separation of the desmes membrane from the from the lamellar graft so uh, and a lot of uh, surface inflammation and the blood vessels were coming into the interface so i decided that this was not going to do well so we decided to change the graft to a larger limbus to limbus graft along with the uh, amniotic membrane graft and tasurephy we had done a lot of other procedures in between uh, multiple bcl applications mmg amgs so if he's nothing worked so i had to do this uh, for a few days he did well but again uh, the cornea started taking up a lot of stain as you can see in these pictures and then uh, and we used to treat it used to get better but again would come back with a lot of staining of the surface and a very dry surface as you can see uh, in the slip pictures and eventually uh, again the epithelium started to break down and the patient started developing persistent epithelial defects who had underwent amg tasurephy multiple number of times and uh, sometime in between uh, he even uh, had a cataract surgery while he was stable uh, after that he developed uh, an infection in the graft along with the persistent epithelial defect as you can see again medical therapy tasurephy this saga was just continuing uh, eventually stabilized then again came back with a uh, ped put a bandage contact lens so something or the other was constantly going on at this point i decided that uh, I, i had had enough and i had exhausted all my options so i decided that we could try pros um, scleral contact lenses so i referred him to lv prasad and after which the patient has come back to me so the reason i present this case here is because grafts in steven johnson cases are very very challenging and one should really think 100 times before we really think of us uh, 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 doing any keratoplasty in a patient way who has bad uh, tears and bad ocular surface because they are prone to recurrent epithelial breakdowns you might think that the eye is doing well for a while but they will eventually come back with some sort of an epithelial breakdown or pd or an infiltrate and these are very difficult to treat so doing a graft will make it many fold worse and uh, we should be very very uh, and graft should be really the last resort in these patients thank you i just wanted to share these two cases and we can have a discussion on these topics so for the discussion uh, dr kuresh muskiti sir and uh, namrata yeah see the, the starting with the second case uh, i mean rishi was uh, was um, soft peddling his words there um saying grafts are challenging um, in uh, steven johnson syndrome according to me the the correct word to use is a two letter word which is no that means no graft in a steven johnson syndrome i mean all of us have burnt our hands at some point or the other why would we still do a graft in a steven johnson when when as rishi correctly pointed out the epithelium is prone to break down there is uh, symplefs happening i mean i i was trying to count the number of times rishi used the word tarsorophy uh, uh in the thing at least six or seven times that he mentioned in maybe six or seven times that imagine a, a, a lids being being cut and sutured cut and sutured i mean uh, and for, for 
for what purpose? If at all you want to give vision to these patients, you can think in terms of a keratoprosthesis uh, of some sort as a last resort if it's the only eye. But uh, uh, otherwise, in a Steven Johnson to play with darks, whether it's a large diameter dark or a small, the epithelium still needs to uh, uh, grow over. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. In the first, first uh, the, the Rishi, the, the, the first one where you mentioned the Steven Johnson where the, the, with the VKC, it was an interesting uh, uh, case diagnosed correctly by you, men, would have been missed by many a people and just gone on to treat as VKC because of the history of chickenpox, which was there uh, earlier. So I, I uh, you did do a good job with the MMG and you, uh, I, I would agree that there was no real need to do a lower lid uh, MMG. Even the upper lip, uh, lid, uh, you did and it did work, but perhaps even without the MMG, just knowing that there is a Steven Johnson and treating it as a Steven Johnson with VKC may have still worked because the, the lid characterization in the upper lid didn't look all that bad to me. Yeah, the Not only like thing I did it was yeah. because we were taking the child under GA anyway for the ulcer, so I thought I might as well add this. And it, <laughs> it, it, something worked. It did help. It did help. Yeah, so 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 it, it worked out, but Suppose you are not taking up the child, maybe even, even without MMG, this result would have come, uh, provided uh, you were vigorous with your SGS therapy. So congrats to you on managing both the difficult cases. And I sympathize with you because the operating, the first surgeon did the dial. You just have to manage after that. So uh, Dr. Basak, sir, any comments from you? Dr. Basak, sir? So, uh, if he's not there, let's go over to Pragya. Pragya. Um, can I add a couple of yes. comments? Yeah. Please. So, um, Dr. Rishi, they were really interesting cases. So, what I have observed is uh, even if there's limbal stem cell reserve and there is an epithelial defect, some of these patients with SJs actually epithelize even with just medical therapy or with AMG. But when we transect the nerves and actually go in and do uh, PK, or even if it's a dark, uh, it doesn't have to be lamellar or full thickness. I've seen that they do exceptionally bad. Uh, I've had a couple of patients where uh, sometimes they're perforated. You just don't have any other option but to do a penetrating keratoplasty. You're surprised and actually very happy that the surface has epithelized. It, so there is some limbal reserve. So the cells are coming in and it is getting epithelized, but I don't think it lasts even for like probably one or two weeks and it starts to break down and enters into a vicious cycle. So uh, um, I think more than limbal stem cell deficiency in these eyes, the dryness is the reason why their grafts fail. And whenever there is a low shimmers, I think we try to do something to salvage uh, but uh, I don't think we would really gain much. Even keratoprosthesis, if we are lucky and there's some conjunctiva coming and epithelizing or dermalizing, that's the only way these things work. But otherwise, we've anyways, I think, gone down. Many of them who even have a lot of tears, somehow they just keep coming down, coming with epithelial breakdowns. It's more than just low shermers. I think it's... I think it's more to do with... Yes. Uh, in some patients, I think it's the inflammation. Periodically, it exacerbates. And you, you don't know why. Maybe it's the inflammatory mediators and because their uh, limbus is not all that healthy. But definitely the ones with dryness, uh, I think uh, they just go downhill. You, you run out of options. Uh, the only other way to do it is do a type 2 K-Pro. Go ahead, do an ocular surface MMG. Let the surface heal then go in and put a capro beneath the MMG or beneath the panis. That's the only thing. But in this case, we wouldn't have that much time to do anything. The cornea would melt in perfect. Right. Uh, Pragya, your case is now. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, are my slides visible? Uh, not yet. Okay. Yes, they are now. Yes, fine. Yeah. So I would really like to thank AIOS and the scientific committee for giving me uh, this opportunity and having this wonderful lineup of talks of uh, uh, in and around dry eye disease. So my talk would be uh, really like 
the image says the devil really lies in the detail. It's not very unusual for us to miss dryness in these patients, uh, especially the ones with milder and subclinical forms. And this becomes much more relevant when it comes to cataract surgery. So why are we talking about cataract and dry eyes in particular? It's because in a hostile environment like it is in dry eyes, uh, even a very routinely performed surgery like cataract can actually have a uh, uh, can be challenging and have uh, suboptimal outcomes and uh, give us surprises. And there's lots of studies which uh, show in literature that there is significant undiagnosed dry eyes in patients who present to our routine cataract surgery clinics, which goes missed and could uh, correlate to the refractive surprises and unhappy patients post-surgery. Apart from that, the phaco emulsification itself has been reported to reduce tear frame breakup time, tear meniscus height, and corneal sensitivity, and also uh, with associated increase in ocular surface staining. While in most cataract patients, this may happen, but it's transient and recovers, this becomes important in those patients who are actually lying on the borderline with subclinical or milder forms of the disease, where addition of medications, inflammation further worsens the consequences and gives us bad results. So in this setting, I would like to discuss two cases today. First one is cataract surgery wherein an underlying dry eye disease was missed. And my second uh, case would be a patient with existing diagnosed dry eye disease and you want to plan a cataract surgery in such a patient. So my first patient uh, was a 63-year-old lady who presented uh, to our clinic with discomfort, burning, pricking sensation associated with blurry vision or more so discomfort while viewing uh, for six weeks following cataract surgery. Uh, so she came with to us because she was unhappy and referred by the primary physician because the inflammation was not going down and he suspected dry eyes. And she did not have any other comorbidities or did not report anything significant. But when we looked at it, it was a well done cataract surgery. But as you can see, even beyond six weeks, there is significant inflammation. There are clogged meguomian orifices. There's mild uh, fading of the luster of the cornea. And actually the tear meniscus height looked a little uh, on the lower side. And the ocular surface staining actually revealed a lot of SPKs and now had filaments uh, all around. And the patient, though had 20-20 parts uh, post-surgery, was actually unhappy because of the photophobia and the uh, associated symptoms. And when we did a Schirmer's one, that is without anesthesia, her Schirmer's was 5 and 3 m at the end of five minutes and tear film breakup time was also four seconds. We went ahead and did a more detailed dry eye examination. But before that, the other eye also showed some SPKs, but the disease was not as severe as in the operated eye, probably because of confounding additional factors of the surgery itself. So when we did additional dry eye uh, diagnostics, so she clearly had very significant in human dysfunction, reduced lipid layer thickness, and also reduced tear meniscus height. So she had a mixed type of dry eye disease that is component of both aqueous deficiency and evaporative. So we went ahead, did an autoimmune workup. She came out positive for RA factor and anti-CCP. We started her on topical steroids, lubricants, and cyclosporin. Along with a rheumatologist, she was initiated on immunosuppressive therapy. Following that, she was better in terms of her symptoms, and she was much more comfortable, but was unhappy that the diagnosis was made after surgery. So probably would have preferred to have been diagnosed to have dry before she was taken up for cataract surgery. So there are various things that this patient could have actually landed up with a lot of refractive surprise because biometry is not always very reliable in these patients and also uh, could have had other complications if the dry was much more severe. The most important thing is that or interesting, I should say, is that the patient knew she had some form of arthritis. She was on Ayurvedic medications for some time, few years ago. And then she obviously will not find it relevant to mention it to a doctor who's going to operate her eye. But we tend to miss out a lot of patients uh, because they don't communicate either. Uh, 
So a quick uh, brief of the second case. This is another case who, had act, who was a 58-year-old lady who presented to us with complaints of new discharge, pain, redness, and watering, and diminished vision for about a month. She had similar such episodes in the past. She was a known case of rheumatoid arthritis who was on treatment prior but had discontinued because she could not tolerate the immunosuppressive. So at presentation, as you can see, the right and left eye had severely inflamed surface, significant mucoid discharge. In the right eye, she actually had hypopion with epithelial defect and uh, um, stromal infiltrates. And uh, uh, she was very miserable. The patient was actually brought on wheelchair because she could not open her eyes. And we started, we sent for conjunctival, we sent for scrapings and uh, the conjunctival swabs. And it had turned out to be staph aureus, which was multi-drug resistant, but um, it responded reasonably well to medical uh, therapy. And then uh, she was also initiated on systemic uh, immunosuppressive therapy, along with topical steroids based on sensitivity. And she recovered well at the end of six weeks. But then she wanted to undergo a surgery, that is cataract surgery in her left eye, because right eye had already undergone it in the past. So now the question is, when do we take up these patients for surgery? So we wanted the ocular surface to stabilize further on. So waited for two to three months, continued her on immunosuppressive therapy and gave her topical uh, medication. So as you can see, the left eye uh, was well controlled. And then uh, it did reasonably well after a cataract surgery. We put the IOL implantation after her biometry became somewhat stable. That is, we repeated multiple readings. And when they were kind of correlating, that's when we decided we'd go ahead and put that IOL power. And then we continue, we stepped up her immunosuppression in periocular period and then continued to do her dry management. So as you can see in the images below also, when we optimize the surface with good uh, steroid therapy and lubricants and systemic immunosuppression wherever required, the surface becomes much better, more stable, the visibility increases, the biometry becomes more predictable, patient comfort and the results also get better. So it is very important to uh, optimize the surface in all these patients. In Towards the other extreme end, where we have these really severe cases of dry associated with cicatrizing conjunctivitis, like the ones with OCP here, also tend to do reasonably well with a cataract surgery when we give them prose lenses. And over a period of time, when we continue to keep them on low potent steroids and immunosuppression, the surface actually gets much better. And here the portion was excised a little during surgery and an AMG was placed, which is the reason the cornea appears much more clearer. And then with clearer lenses, we can actually rehabilitate these patients without a lot of risk uh, to a large extent. So all in all, uh, I would like to say that when patients present to our clinic for a uh, cataract surgery, I think it's very important to look for certain signs. That is, examine the lid for meibomian gland dysfunction. Look for a lot of debris if it's collecting. It should have otherwise been cleared from the eye, but maybe because of low uh, tear production, it is not being cleared. Look for SPKs and look for loss of sheen of cornea. And once that's there, it's very important for us to do tear film breakup time. And if in doubt, you could always assess the lacrimal gland secretions by placing a fluorescein strip over the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland and look for the number of, uh, uh, look for the quantity and the number of ducts that are uh, giving away the tears. Then you would know whether you know, you're dealing with dryness or not, or is there a component of aqueous deficiency or not. And then, uh, you can take them up for surgery. So in a nutshell, it is very important to look for subclinical dry eye disease in all patients presenting for cataract surgery, especially if you're con if we're considering premium IELTS. And we should not forget to examine the meibomian glands. And preoperatively, optimization of the ocular surface is really required if any deviations are noted on preliminary examinations. And then we, it's best to plan surgery after stabilization of biometry, especially in patients with dry eye, that is take multiple readings. And when the deviation is not too much, that's when you think, and when the SPKs are cleared and the surface appears stable, that's when I think you should go ahead and uh, do the surgery. And then it's very important to perioperatively and postoperatively manage the patient in terms of immunosuppression and topical lubricants, stepping up steroids uh, for alleviating the symptoms of dry eyes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pragya. And uh, I think uh, our discussants, Dr. Maipal Sir, has not uh, joined us yet. And uh, Dr. Harman <clears throat> had to leave. 
So could we have uh, quick uh, comments from uh, Quresh sir and Dr. Samar Basak if you are there? Yeah, uh, that that was a uh, Pragna. That was a good presentation of uh, uh, cataract surgery, and unfortunately, most cataract surgeons put the patient on slit lamp, bypass all layers till they reach the cataract. Just see whether somebody has removed it in the past. If not, then it's a mature cataract and to be removed. So the front portions are generally not seen on a cataract surgeon's slit lamp, unfortunately. So the question of staining and uh, uh, looking for the uh, lacrimal gland, uh, the, the, that incidentally, I, I also very recently started doing Pragna after, after webinars. Uh, and it's a very elegant may, way of um, checking the uh, ducts coming from the uh, lacrimal gland. And it, it, it adds one more thing to armamentarium because none of your uh, the SBM machines or all those uh, diagnostic machines have this. And it's such a simple, elegant uh, test which you can do uh, in even a rural um, uh, setup. So uh, it's, it's nice to know a patient has dry eye prior to cataract surgery. And uh, I also agree, I use a lot of immunosuppressives in patients. There's many patients who are not diagnosed preoperatively with rheumatoid and other collagen disorders um, uh, who end up with really bad post-op eating your head after uneventful surgery. So um, uh, again, an excellent presentation and a lot of take-home messages for cataract surgeons. Thank you, sir. Uh, Maipal, sir, you've just joined. Uh, Maipal, sir, are you there? Yeah. Sir, uh, Pragya just uh, you know, uh, told us about two cases excellently demonstrated and uh, the protocol of a cataract surgery. Where does the dry eye protocol or the dry eye testing fit in, sir? Uh, in your hospitals, what would you do before a cataract surgery? Would you do a dry eye assessment or uh, is it done only for selective cases? So, uh, frankly, Bartha, I think the focus on dry eye uh, has increased over the last couple of years. And uh, even though uh, uh, I had personally worked on the mybography way back in 89, 90 in Georgetown University where the mybography was described, I really, uh, the impact of dry eye really uh, 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 was really not felt to that extent as is being felt now and uh, with the new treatment modalities that are coming in. Uh, dry eye evaluation for us is a mandatory thing for pre-LASIK workup, but it's still not mandatory for cataract uh, surgery uh, as things stand today. But I think there is no harm in uh, taking this as a uh, this thing because we just started uh, four or five years ago a pre-cataract workup package that includes a specular microscopy and OCT and an IOL master. So that is something that uh, has become because we have been stung by a couple of patients who had some uh, unpicked or undiagnosed uh, macular pathology like an ERM or something like that which was not diagnosed. And the patient was very, very unhappy as regards the outcome. So therefore we are doing the OCT but not so far the dry eye protocol. But I think uh, as things are going to happen and as the premium intraocular lenses are coming in, that is going to become more and more important because the patients are dysfunctional and uh, the common thing they say is Radak Padraya, we are not happy, et cetera, et cetera. They have no problem with the vision, but then they are very, very unhappy and that continues for long. So obviously they had a pre-existing uh, dry eye because we are dealing with the geriatric age group and as in the geriatric age group and especially uh, postmenopausal women, uh, the chances of having uh, a dry eye are much higher. So I would say strongly because uh, uh, in India we are dealing much with numbers, but I think in the Western countries, the dry eye evaluation has become uh, in a lot of places a standard of care that is there and the OSA, et cetera, they give uh, uh, reasonably good information. One important thing is that uh, whenever you are doing in cataract surgery, a biometry, the patient should not be having a dry eye because that can give uh, a, a off uh, uh, refractive error kind of a IUL power calculation and you should uh, pre-treat that person uh, for uh, dry eye um, before actually doing the IUL master. And the other thing is that the cornea should not have been touched with an applanation or uh, had a paracane or a xylocaine, et cetera, instilled. Uh, before doing the uh, IUL master. So these are a couple of things that is there, but uh, just to answer your question, it is still not a standard of care. Uh, the only thing is because we charge separate for OSA, uh, that is, and it's still not available on the centers. Shermers, 
uh, is gaming ground, uh, but uh, LASIK, yes, standard of care. Uh, Partha, if I could intervene yeah. here. Yes, yeah, yes, in please. our place, we are doing Shermus and Mabography. But uh, is it that you would do a fluorescein test to look at the aqueous uh, tear deficiency in all your cataract patients, Pragya? Uh, no, uh, I think for me, the thing that works out best whenever I'm seeing any patient is I try to look at the tear meniscus height. How does it look in our normal patients to kind of have a reticule kind of a thing in the head so that I know that this is where the normal should belong. So as I found it very useful, as I keep using it in normal patients, then when I see that the yeah, meniscus height doesn't look really good to me, or there is some debris collection that is unusual, or the cornea doesn't look as glossy as it should, or the adjacent conjunctiva, then I go in and then do a Schirmer's one first before putting in any drops. And then I would do a surface staining to a uh, confirm the uh, dryness but uh, sometimes it so of uh, happens that the patient actually complains of dryness we do the shamas it looks good uh, you know you, we can have gland secretions have a look normal then probably looking at more of an evaporative component probably the tear film is actually breaking up faster and uh, stuff like that so either which ways I found that uh, with the number of premium IOLs uh, that are increasing, I think having a dialogue with the patient is very important preoperatively that if there is dry eye disease and this is good and this is not good for you because most often patients are not very happy having the diagnosis after surgery. So I think uh, it's too much to ask for a complete detailed surface staining examination for every cataract patient. Uh, for me, the easiest way is to try and have a look at unstained tear meniscus height. It may be difficult in the beginning, but definitely works over a period of time. We'll be able to pick up that we can actually try and correlate it with shamas and then you will know, no, no, this shamas should be somewhere around 10. I think so, something like that. So actually we are reaching on a very important question. Uh, in a busy clinic for a cataract practitioner, should he institute a dry eye protocol and should he have his optometrist or his, uh, or his technicians do the dry eye, the shamas, the T-butt and uh, the tear meniscus staining by them to get a feedback because for cataract surgeons doing all this plus what Pragya said that you know judging the cornea by its glossiness that comes from experience of a cornea surgeon mainly so should we institute it or should we not and let's look at uh, my sir has already said um, Chitra has already said uh, let's ask um, uh, Rishi Rishi uh, Rishi Mohan uh, would you have in all your cataract patients a dry eye protocol? Uh, thanks, Patha. I think uh, it's a very good question and uh, it never used to exist. But uh, again, as Maipal rightly said over the last few years, the importance of uh, dry eye has picked up so much that it has become imperative now to check these patients. Uh, premium IOLs, of course, uh, it's a standard of care. Uh, I agree with the clinical approach wherein you need to be a little choosy as to which patient you will do a dry eye assessment and which eye you won't. Uh, but uh, these patients often have, along with a low tear meniscus height, an element of a lid parallel conjunctival fold at that age group. So there's an element of conjunctival calasis which will throw off any assessment, uh, clinical or even any of these machines which are looking at TMH are not going to give you an accuracy when there is a small conjunctival fold or a little bit of calasis. So that's important. Anybody with more than a 0.75 cylinder in my practice uh, coming up on K-readings is going to get a dry eye assessment and they will, uh, they will have to get repeated on more than one uh, technology to try and assess the accuracy of the cylindrical component as well as the axis. So for premium IOLs, uh, which includes toric monofocals, yes, it's the standard of care now. For monofocals, um, not as much. So there it's a bit more uh, of choice wherein we look at it clinically and then take a call. Okay. Narin, at your hospital, what is uh, the standard of care? Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, so basically, I think like uh, sir said, I think we also follow the same, you know, clinically we observe and uh, if there's any signs of, or uh, even from complaints to any signs of any kind of dry eyes, be it MGD or anything, then immediately they go through a complete uh, screening screen tool. But uh, for premium IOLs, we do. Uh, definitely, there is no doubt about it. 
and uh, i mean what other thing is uh, normally i personally do even in refractive and cataract is even in normal patients even if they don't have dry eyes i start about 2 or 3 days before the the steroids which i'm giving post operatively so that what it does is uh, whatever little about if at all a patient has some amount of slight inflammation in the eyes it'll just make it you know uh, much lesser cooler you know cool the eye and make it much more quieter and then we uh, go ahead with the surgery the so patients do much much better i truly believe that there is a tipping point for dry eyes so if it goes beyond that inflammation that's when you know you have a very long term of uh, dry eyes and it's very difficult to handle those patients okay so for all patients of cataract surgery you start off the steroid 3 days prior to that I yes mean- yes sir even refractive whatever the steroid i'm giving post operatively i start 2 or 3 days before and then mm-hmm. continue i mean as per the you know quickly taper after the surgery okay. so this i have i found it much much better you know the number of complaints of uh, you know even though we we assess and then everything is fine no dry eyes we do the surgery sometimes we have those set of patients who get developed dry eyes i feel these are the set of patients who have a slight amount of inflammation in the eye and there's a it gets tipped off after the surgery and then we have a long term thing but this small thing it made a lot of difference okay uh, so narin uh, let's go over to your presentation yes, sir. thank you sir. can you see my screen sir yeah Okay. Uh good evening everyone. On this onset I would like to thank AOS for giving me this opportunity. Today I'm going to talk about dry eye post refractive surgery. Now, dry eye post refractive surgery is become more of a short term uh temporary phenomenon which even patients don't actually uh, feel it most of the time because we have all of us have been you know being uh, you know doing very meticulous screening and uh, treatment before we choose the patient for the surgery. but if you look at all the side effects of the refractive surgery definitely dry eyes is one of the most common ones now when we look at the pathology uh, post refractive there is damage to the subbasal or subepithelial corneal nerves uh, there can be damage to the goggle cells or alteration in the corneal uh, curvature and this leads to decreased sensitivity and uh, unstable tear film and leads to dd now there are many complications of dry eyes post refractive uh, surgery but uh, there are different risk factors also so let's go over one of them uh, now when we look at uh, like uh, you know like the previous speaker also mentioned that age is one of the factors as we become older the cornea sensitivity reduces there's a more risk of uh, dry eyes and also it is more common in females now when we look at the different kinds of surgery uh, uh, it has been established that dry eyes is more common in lasik compared to the rest of the surgeries and the several studies have stated the same now why is that so whenever we do a lasik or create a flap there's total disruption of the corneal nerves uh, when the flap making is done almost 90% has decreased corneal uh, nerve fibers uh, density and uh, when we look at the smile uh, there is uh, it's more of a minimal invasive and uh, you, you know the corneal subbasal uh, nerve plexus to a greater extent is preserved now when we actually visualize the uh, the corneal nerves there is decrease uh, in uh, sub basal uh, nerve density uh, lesser in smile compared to fs lasik now this is the imaging of uh, the eye at uh, one month uh, three months and six months as you can see one month and three months it is significantly lesser in smile compared to i mean sorry in lasik compared to smile now uh, now when we look at the positioning of the hinge if you have a superior hinge you cut both the uh, 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock uh, neuroplexus uh, thus you know there are more chance of uh, dry eyes for surgery but if you do it uh, nasally or temporarily you save one of the arms so that way uh, it's the cornea is a little more sensitive now if you have a larger hinge definitely you save more uh, nerves and lesser dry eyes now in trans prk there is a significant decrease in corneal sensation but uh, there is a faster recovery and rapid corneal nerve regeneration post surgery now fakic iol implantation is uh, one of the least uh, chances of uh, dry eyes post uh, refractive surgery and uh, when we uh, look at the amount of refractive power being corrected obviously more you ablate you damage more nerves and there are more chances of dry eyes now uh pre operatively make sure you take a detailed examination osdi uh, do a thorough sutlap examination do a corneal uh, topography and look at the membrane glands definitely 
And the last three things, uh, if at all it is there in the institute, we can use it where we have, you know, in vivo, uh, in vivo or confocal microscopy, you use uh, vitamin D and also uh, look for uh, inflammatory markers. So once you have identified or uh, screened it, then you can grade it, uh, I mean, put it into different categories like so and uh, treat it uh, like this. But uh, to keep it very simple, let's say if they have uh, mild dry eyes, uh, you can start uh, low potent steroids, uh, some uh, lubricants and also cyclosporine. And uh, if at all patient has MGD or uh, vitamin D deficiency, you just add it to it. Now, when we have moderate dry eyes, uh, we use more high potent uh, steroids. And uh, uh, depending on what the problem has, that also should be added. And we can also add lippy flow or uh, eye light or eye, uh, EI for the patient. So once you have done this, we'll see at four, four to six weeks and then reassess whether you can go ahead. Now, when we look at uh, lippy flow, basically it uh, heat massages the lid, uh, lid and brings, it, uh, brings up the temperature to uh, 42.5 degrees. And uh, so we did a study where we looked at two groups where we did preoperative lippy flow and uh, postoperatively, I mean, uh, one group without lippy flow. And we found uh, the OSDI, uh, you know, uh, beautifully it is, uh, you can easily differentiate between the two arms where uh, pre uh, lippy flow, uh, the OS, uh, OSDI is much lower as compared to uh, without lippy flow. And also when you look at, we, we looked at uh, the markers, there is uh, increased anti uh, not uh, factors and decreased pro-inflammatory factors uh, in patients who went uh, pre-op lippy flow. Now, you can also do uh, I, EI or uh, eye light. So basically, this stimulates the membrane gland secretions. And uh, we usually do uh, these kind of procedures if patients already has a lot of acne and dry eyes together. So that time, these, these patients do really well in this particular treatment. Uh, I won't go to the post-operative dry eye treatment. I think it's kind of similar to what uh, preoperative is. Let's go over a few cases. Uh, case one, here's a, a smile patient post-op uh, four months uh, where complaints uh, came with us with burning of sensation in the eyes and had 6-6 six, six vision in both eyes. So we did a detailed examination of the patient uh, and uh, this is how the, res uh, the test results were look like. Uh, the tear breaker time was less, the OSDI was high, but the patient had uh, a deficiency of vitamin D and borderline hemoglobin. So we put the patient on uh, treatment and the uh, patient uh, did beautifully, beautifully well. Now, this is one more case where the patient had uh, a LASIK six months back, had 6-6 six, six parts vision uh, and uh, complaints of burning sensation, dry eyes and body sensation. So when we looked at uh, the eye, we found the presence of a few capped glands. The patient had MGD and uh, we put the patient on uh, a treatment, but actually uh, still the patient didn't have improvement. So we added the lippy flow to it and the patient beautifully improved and the patient had very nice uh, low OSI. So this is the last case uh, where we have a LASIK patient who a 22 year old uh, female patient who came to us who had 6 vision with minus two uh, power. And uh, on, uh, on examination, there was uh, epithelial uh, regularity. So we did uh, certain other tests and this is how uh, the patient looked like. And the patient also had vitamin D deficiency. Now, this was the preoperative, uh, 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 how the preoperative cornea looked like and postoperatively, uh, sorry, uh, preoperatively, when we look at the confocal, you can see the immature dendritic cells in the eye. And once we did uh, LASIK in this patient, the patient had very abnormal wound healing. There was epithelial hyperplasia and so on and so forth. And the patient's vision wasn't that great. So whenever you do, do see a lot of epithelial irregularities, please put the patient on treatment uh, and at four, four to six weeks, reassess and then go ahead with the treatment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Naren. Uh, uh, Dr. Chitra. Yeah, actually, uh, Naren, you talked of uh, different aspects of uh, dry eye, but there's one other interesting thing which you also need to remember in refractive surgery, that the regression which is seen is more uh, noticed in dry eye patients. And, you know, it has been interestingly attributed to a release of an epidermal growth factor, which uh, causes epithelial hyperplasia and one cause of uh, regression. And the other thing it seems is because in a dry eye, there's release of inflammatory cytokine, inflammatory cytokines, and that causes apoptosis of cells, and that causes an altered anterior stromal remodeling. So these things are happening 
in the dry eye patients and that is why there is more regression likely so one big message i got was like all the other discussions that in our post plastic patients or refractive surgery patients we should really concentrate on ensuring that the dry eye status is very well treated because some of the other uh, unexpected uh, surprises come i have two questions for you one is if you have a patient of rheumatoid arthritis who has been uh has come to you and is very keen on undergoing a refractive surgery patient would you treat him if his systemic condition is stable uh, what are uh, your thoughts ma'am and uh, normally i i personally believe that if i find anything out of the ordinary i would i, I just simply go ahead with the fakie cleanse because uh, they they do extremely well uh, the results are 6 6 bang on the next day no issues with dry eyes so if i find anything that is patients have very severe dry eyes or some other you know collagen bas i mean i i don't simply why to take the risk even though the risk uh, is low but it is more than a regular patient so i don't want to take the risk i would definitely go with fakie cleanse yeah i i do agree with your point but uh, but we need not spread the message out that yes i understand i personally do that but and i is quiet and they, they can be uh, continued with that treatment and you could still uh, do a refractive surgery apparently the other thing is what is the cut off which all of us would look at to say that this eye has significant dry eye and we will not do refractive surgery of any form is there any I such cut off uh the thing is ma'am if after treatment patients uh, i i i believe that is severe anything severe or uh, neurologic i i just completely uh, don't do any treatment and they have to respond to the treatment once we come back the patient What's comes severe? back uh, uh the, the mild or moderate yeah mild or moderate uh, when they come back they are symptomatically better they have absolutely no complaints their eye looks better uh, then i am definitely would go for it definitely yes Martha, you have any? Yes, uh, good to hear. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Uh, just uh, you are mentioning about uh, probably you are the only one in institute. We are all proud that you have got all three modalities of treatment. Either it is lipid flow or this side uh, highlight and one more treatment you are telling. See, uh, my question to you. Suppose the how many sitting lipid flow you have to do one. Suppose like as you showed in your protocol that of, of course patient with the dry eye you treat them for four to six weeks then you call them for refractive procedure. Suppose one patient come to you is a very V V A P patient been influenced with so much they want to get operated. Okay today he has come after couple of days he want to get a refractive surgery done. Will you go ahead with the lipid flow today and after a day or two? Will you go ahead with the refractive treatment? Uh, so the thing is, if if the patient doesn't have any dry eyes or patient's perfectly normal, nothing is required. We can just simply go ahead. I mean, if the patient time. is having a dry eye, yeah, for sure, must be around. Definitely, if if the patient has dry eyes, I think the problem always happens with the VIP sir. So never. The thing is, we skip protocols. Uh, just that we have to make sure that they follow the same line, same protocol. and the results will be always bang on the thing is whenever vip comes we skip a few steps and that's where the mistake happens <laughs> do you really put this cyclosporin eye drops if you have already treated the patient for 4 to 6 weeks then you have done all the pre operative work up your post op results also good post operatively after tapering the steroid will you put them once again back them with the cyclosporins Yeah, yes, sir, definitely. Usually, cyclosporins for a quite some, a, a quite a long time because it has it has a very slow action. By the time it becomes uh, effective, so it takes a month or so. So we continue for a few months. Uh, so by the time the surgery also is done, after surgery we just continue. That is, we are talking about if the patient already has some amount of dry eyes pre-operative, post-operative. I mean, regular eyes we don't use cyclosporin as a protocol. But if they have, then uh, pre-operatively we start, and it goes on post-operatively for a few months. thank you so a very specific yeah, question uh, there in here uh, yes. is uh, you know even after 3 months or 6 months patient still complaining 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 when will you stay stop to cyclosporin when when do you say stop to cyclosporin uh, uh, yes sir. so so it's not uh, actually, working basically it's not working 
Yes, sir. So uh, we uh, the, what normally we do is, sir, let's say if you have not done, uh, usually this liquid flow works really well in uh, such patients who don't respond even after, let's say, uh, six months or so. I, I, I don't know if I mentioned in the, the slide, but uh, once we do that, actually it's shown extremely promising because what happens is even we tell uh, hot compression and lid massage, one is the patient is continuously pressing on the eye. So that's actually, it's not good for the eye, the, uh, the lid massage. So this is something that actually massages only the lid and doesn't put pressure on the eye. So, and, it, and, it, and one treatment uh, lasts for quite some time. It's like months together, let's say about even six to seven months, one treatment is more than enough and patients extremely, extremely happy. And in fact, they just simply come, even if they don't have symptoms, we have had patients who just come after six to seven months. Okay. I just want it. And do you have any symptoms? No, <laughs> but so they really also, like the massage. Yeah. I also feel there is a neuropathic component to this dry eye in some of these patients that Partha was alluding to. So they, that pain and discomfort has to be attributed to dry eyes. And sometimes these patients may not have been very compliant with their medications. So you have to spend that time to counsel them put them on to the higher end uh, artificial tears, which has sodium halonate and polyethene glycol and those medications and cyclosporin. You could even go on with it for six months to one year, and I'm sure they would largely settle down. A right. small uh, quick comment. Uh, uh, regarding rheumatoid arthritis, so I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. Most often we find rheumatoid arthritis patients uh, may not have low shimmers. Uh, um, uh, or because, but the issue with this is it's a progressive kind of a disease. We don't know at what stage it is or whether it's on the borderline or not. So like Dr. Chitra was mentioning, I think uh, the message should be set right that these patients have mechanisms that we may not completely understand, which are causing dryness. So doing any intervention in the form of uh, anything which compromises the corneal nerves or their stability, I think, or uh, the reflex secretion for that matter should not be done. So I think for all cases which have any other autoimmune etiology, which can work on the lacrimal gland secretion, we should not be doing any um, refractive surgery. And another quick point, I've had a couple of my patients who uh, come with issues of post-refractive dry eye, then we do their shummers. It's normal. It's filling up these tears by 32. And then we just uh, attribute it to either neuropathic pain or uh, uh, that it is um, just uh, more of a psychological thing for the patient that they're very, very uh, sensitive towards these things. But I've seen that a couple of them actually have a very short tear film breakup time. It could be as short as three seconds, two seconds. And we generally don't go that far if it's a normal shamas we think it's okay it's not dry eyes but even with good tear production if it's evaporating faster their visual quality everything goes down and they may then get actually get into the loop of depression because here mm -hmm. they have gone in and electively got a surgery done when they were 2020 with classes so i think it's a very important thing treat their mgd really well and then i've seen most of the most of the patients were much more comfortable. So I think tear film breakup time should also be something very importantly evaluated in all these patients who come with post-refractive dry eye. Ma'am, if so I can the, make one more yeah. point. Yes, yes. I can, sir. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I think uh, like rightly, Madam said, um, I mean, see, one thing is very clear that we don't have to have a liquid flow. Even if you don't have it, make sure you get the forceps. You get these forceps, which you can actually massage the eyelids. So you just dip it in uh, some hot, uh, you know, uh, really sterile hot water and uh, make it warm. And then you do the lid massage. Uh, that should be good enough. I mean, it's not as effective as the lippy flow, but it, it's, 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 it's like a, you know, um, just a cost. I mean, just one instrument, you can use it for many patients, sterilize it and use it. So I feel this is something that we need to do. I mean, I, I personally do for all MGD patients. Uh, if they can't afford or uh, they can't, uh, uh, you know, that particular treatment because it's, it is an expensive treatment. So if they can't afford, I just simply, uh, you know, as a protocol, I just tell them, okay, this is what you do. You do hot compression and so on and so forth, but we will do a little ma ma lid massage for you so that we bring out all the secretions because if that initial thick secretions is removed out, it is easier for the membrane glands to breathe. So, yes, sir. So, uh, so last uh, comment, sir, uh, from uh, Bhagal, sir. Sir, yeah, Parka, uh, I'll just uh, wish to add on. This is what uh, uh, we learned from uh, uh, our uh, beloved Professor Madan Mohan. 
uh, even at that particular time, he would uh, do a lid spatula, put a lid spatula, put some xylocaine, and we would uh, do a, um, a firm massage to uh, express out the secretion. That is very, very important. And then betadine uh, would be used for the at the edges of the lids, which is there. Even uh, today, I got a patient from one of my uh, uh, fellow colleagues uh, who's uh, done two or three retina surgeries in the patient. The patient was very, very unhappy and he said, Ke bhai, mene, I have shown to one retina surgeon, another retina surgeon, three people I have said, they've all said retina is settled, everything is good, this, that, and SOR has been done. And when I looked at the lids, they were like, uh, it, it was a very bad case of MGD. So uh, they, 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 the, the, the kind of emphasis that we are getting over the last few uh, years on dry eye and also because of the environmental uh, pollution and breaking off of the tears, etc., etc., it has increased computer vision syndrome also, it has increased. But the other emphasis that we are getting today is on the MGD. And MGD, if you start looking, I am really surprised that when I start looking at these chronic patients, most of them have MGD and a simple thing of warm compresses followed by lid massage, followed by eye wipes, etc. And maybe a course of uh, uh, any tetracycline or doxycycline, etc. They definitely, definitely help, help these people. And uh, I am getting great results. I did not buy the uh, Lippy Flow because uh, it uh, is expensive. And uh, the, as uh, Narain was saying, uh, warm compresses can help. I have uh, rather uh, started doing a lot of these... Uh, IPL treatments and I think they are also giving great results and the patients are pretty pretty happy on that. So I think dry eye has become something very very important in uh, our armamentarium. It is something that we need to look at because it is a chronic discomfort kind of a situation that is there uh, which the patient has and the patient will blame it on the surgery. The patient will not say that because it just gets aggravated after surgery and the patient starts to notice and the patient is more concerned about symptoms within the eye, etc. So uh, even, uh, uh, even, sorry, and that is something very, very important that we need to now carefully look at dry eye. The only problem is that our systems are so made as was uh, being said, whether it's a SOP or not, that by the time the patient reaches the counseling, and the patient wants a trifocal lens or a premium lens, everything is washed. You can't then, you'll have to call the patient again to do a dry eye workup. So that's a slight logistic problem that is there because you can't say from beforehand what the patient will be doing and whether the patient is going for a cataract uh, surgery, etc. But somehow or the other, I think uh, uh, we are going to have happier patients if we diagnose and treat uh, even preoperatively and postoperatively uh, uh, the, the uh, dry eye disease. Uh, Dr. Patra, Thank one uh, quick question I actually had for the panel, if I may. So, uh, sometimes dry eye is missed and by chance a pre-existing, even if it's a milder form, is missed and the patient actually has a multifocal or trifocal in one of the eyes and is unhappy. What do we do with the other eye? With the other uh, eye? Why <laughs> will you treat the dry eye status and sort the, all the issues? And then to the other eye, how is multifocal going to be against a dry eye? Uh, I, the present multifocal... Uh, no, uh, no it, there no, is a limitation uh, because if the ocular surface is not good, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, amount of uh, deterioration in the quality of vision, like when you say that if there is a residual astigmatism in a trifocal lens or a multifocal lens, the, uh, the uh, dysphotopsias disproportionately increase as also the deterioration in the quality. Similarly, if the ocular surface is bad, that's going to hit a multifocal lens much, much uh, uh, more than it is going to hit a monofocal or an eye hands today. So that is why it is important uh, I, I do. also in the toricity because in the toric lenses, A, the amount of toricity that is there can be incorrectly uh, diagnosed by the uh, by the IUL master or the lens star or whatever it is. And postoperatively also the ocular surface is not going to give you a, quick, uh, a good uh, outcome. So premium IULs, yes, uh, uh, dry eye is going to be much, much more uh, uh, imperative for us to treat them uh, rather than in monofocal lenses. Most often they come very unhappy with that eye. So what solution do we offer to them uh, for the other eye? Because they're seeking for some solution. So they're kind of in a trap. Uh, for dry eye, the only thing is that it becomes an odd situation where you have put a multifocal and then you turn around and tell the patient that because you have a severe dry eye, which I missed diagnosing and I will not be able to do that. But often I think nowadays, 
with the newer modalities of treatment that we have and also with the cyclosporin etc the use of the drugs as also the ipl uh, lipiflo etc uh, we are uh, in a better position to get comfort to these patients and you have to tell them because normally I am uh, all refractive cases earlier, but now in all cases of cataract, uh, we are giving uh, uh, lubricant eye drops to all patients. So I've yes. had a couple of okay. patients where RA was missed and they've undergone trifocals outside. Now they've been referred to LVP. So uh, uh, it's just such a fix that you don't know what. To do uh, I think let's go over to, to CMS, right? <laughs> From LVP, you refer them to CMS, we will take care of them. <laughs> you can refer them to us too, we'll take care of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, Rishi, uh, Dr. Rishi Mohan, um, would you like to share your presentation, sir? Sure. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes. All right. Uh, so thank you so much, Partha, for uh, making me a part of this uh, symposium. And uh, the talk that I've been asked to deliver is on computer vision syndrome and its relationship with dry eye. It's a bit of a didactic talk, but at the end of this, uh, I will come up with some uh, small pearls, which would be useful in, uh, in giving and offering therapy to these patients. There are no financial interests of any relevance in this talk. So um, the computer vision syndrome is now called digital eye strain or DES. And it is the continuous usage of digital design devices that has led to an increase in this. And uh, it's uh, characterized by eye strain, dryness, and blurred vision. And this broad range of these eye vision related symptoms is now collectively called as digital eye strain. The wide availability of the internet has revolutionized information technology and now there are smartphones, there are tablets and there are other gadgets. And in 2020, the pandemic has now created a sharp increase in the digitalization of almost all these activities. A major component of digital eye strain is actually dry eye. So there are other aspects to DES as well. And DED, as we know, is a multifactorial condition and is characterized by a combination of ocular surface symptoms and with signs as well. Uh, the prevalence of digital screen usage, uh, just to give an idea, is that uh, uh, it is an average of five and a half hours a day. And with mobile phones, desktops and laptops and other devices uh, in, in the US, 78% of adult Americans own computers and 77% have smartphones, 51% have tablets, and 22% have e-readers. It's uh, estimated that adults in the UK spend more than four hours daily using digital media, and there's similar data in the US. Uh, in large-scale population-based Japanese studies, uh, dry eye disease was higher in those with uh, those who spent more time on these screens rather than those who did less time on these screens. And in women, the study showed a similar high prevalence, but even higher than they were seen in men. In India too, uh, there was a study conducted in undergraduate medical students in Srinagar uh, with smartphones and tablets. And for those who use the screen for one to two hours, about 41% had a dry eye. Those who used it for more than two to four hours daily, the prevalence was 75%. And for those using the screen for more than four hours, 93% had a dry eye. The commonest symptom again was eye fatigue followed by headaches and blurred vision. This is uh, the, uh, the breakdown of uh, the symptoms of uh, digital eye strain based on the type of exposure with the vision related, both refractive and oculomotor and ocular surface related where there is blinking and contact lens wear and the pathology of uh, of the, uh, the tissues that are involved, uh, but eventually they all lead to a decrease in blink rate, the, the decrease in amplitude and the lens eyelid in, interaction. There's an uneven tear distribution and instability of the thin tear film and an increased friction, which then leads to the multitude of symptoms that we see. When we talk about refractive uh, issues with the digitalized strain, it's largely the refractive error, the presbyopia, which creates the problem, and then excessive use of screens creates oculomotor problems as well. Uh, and when there are associated phorias and accommodative or virgins issues, 
then there is a fixation disparity and there is all the fluctuations that are there leading to blurred vision and diplopia. Similarly, the use of handled uh, smartphones and tablets, PCs, and concomitant blinking uh, loss as well as contact lens wear sets up a kind of symp symptomatology which is vision related, ocular surface related, and device related as can be seen in this table. The increased computer usage, as we can see, is uh, well documented. 2.3 billion people in Asia, as well as a vast majority of people in Europe and in North America use some form of uh, a, a smart device, like a computer or a laptop, and they are the ones who are primarily at risk. So why does uh, computer vision syndrome actually occur? So computer screens are made up of pixels, and these are hard for the eyes to focus on continuously because they keep getting refreshed. And the user must therefore focus again and again to keep the images sharp. And this results in a receptive stress of the eye muscles. And the dry eye part occurs due to the drop in the blink rate, which drops from an average of 14 times per minute in normal individuals to uh, four to six times a minute during computer and screen use. So here are some uh, commandments in a sense that one can suggest for people who are having dry eye. One is, get a comprehensive eye exam and computer users should have an eye exam before they start working on computers and once a year thereafter. And this is a recommendation of the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health and use proper lighting because eye strain often is caused either by excessively bright light and uh, uh, in many offices, both outdoor as well as interior, the ambient lighting should be about half as bright as that typically found in offices and must eliminate the exterior light by closing drapes, shades or blinds, reduce the interior lighting and position your computer monitor or screen so that the windows are to the side instead of in front or behind. Minimizing the glare, uh, using anti-glare screens, using lenses with an anti-reflective coating and the glare on the walls and finished surfaces can be treated upgrading the displays with LCD LED screens, which are better than the old tube style monitors and choosing screens with a higher resolution and relatively large displays, adjusting the computer display settings or off on the screen. So as you can see on this, uh, on the table on the right, a computer screen with black text on the white background is best and other high contrast combinations also work well low contrast texts and background color schemes don't work that well and give more strain and text on a busy background is also tiring to read. Blinking more often is very important and every 20 minutes one should blink slowly like as if one is falling asleep uh, by about 10 times and uh, the, the, the use of eye exercises by constant focusing on screens that the screen the strain and the tiredness and fatigue that sets in one must look at the computer, look away from the computer every 20 minutes and follow the 20-20-20 rule. Look far away at an object for 10 to 15 seconds, then gaze something up close and then look back at a distant object. And this repeated often prevents accommodative scam, uh, spasm, and don't forget to blink during these exercises. Taking frequent breaks, again, is very, very important. And one needs to also sometimes stand up, move about, stretch arms, legs, back, and the neck uh, to reduce tension and muscle fatigue. Uh, computer eyewear can be specifically modified to create computerized glasses, which are customized. And these are, are good for you, if you, especially if you wear bifocals or progressive lenses. And especially true if one normally wears contact lenses, which may become dry and uncomfortable during sustained computer work. And lastly, to modify the workplace by placing written pages on a copy stand adjacent to the monitor, positioning the computer at a proper height and at a proper distance, lighting the computer stand properly, make sure the desk lamp doesn't shine into the eyes or reflect and adjust the workstation chair according to the correct height. So to, to summarize, computer vision syndrome is now known as digitalized strain and is gaining prevalence. It occurs due to the constant focusing of the eyes on a computer or other screens for a long periods of time, resulting in inability of eye muscles to recover. And this also results in a chronic dry eye. It just doesn't occur through the use of computers. Other devices contribute equally. And one of the major reasons for dry eye disease, at least in the current scenario, is the digitalized strain uh, produced by these, uh, these devices. 
One should follow the 10 commandments that I have listed and to avoid a dry eye, effort should be made to use tips which stimulate tear production as well as the conventional therapies. So thanks very much. Uh, I hope uh, um, I, this uh, topic is open. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Rishi. Thank you. Uh, this was really very nicely summed up. And uh, we have Rajesh. Rajesh, your comments on this? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Partha, for commenting on uh, Dr. Rishi's presentation, who is always very meticulous in covering up everything. And very rightly pointed out that, you know, it's the digital eye strain. Basically, computer syndrome, the terminology includes a syndrome, which, which means that it's a multi-system, uh, you know, it's affecting multiple systems. And computer vision syndrome includes everything, which includes your bad posture while, you know, watching the screen. So you can have neck problems, you can have back problems, you can have multiple uh, such things. So that's why very rightly pointed out digital eye strain about which uh, we ophthalmologists deal with. And um, I guess most of the things have been very uh, rightly pointed out apart from all these uh, points that have been pointed out. Uh, I mean, uh, the mainstay of treatment again remains the same. We have to give lubricants because mostly it's the evaporative type of dry eye that happens. But what happens that with the chronicity of the problem, the, the, there is subtle inflammation that sets in and that sometimes, uh, you know, even with uh, a little bit of uh, lubricants, it doesn't help. So maybe uh, surface uh, reduction of surface inflammation um, by, you know, something like cyclosporine, etc. will will help. That is one. And apart from the 10 commandments that Dr. Rishi was mentioning, I think we all ophthalmologists are very much prone to develop uh, these uh, digital eye strain, uh, particularly in this COVID era when we are switching on from one, switching from one webinar to the other and having multiple hours sitting in front of the laptop screen. So that is definitely there. And uh, I mean, I guess uh, uh, all these points regarding blinking, regarding, you know, taking a break, etc., needs to be uh, emphasized uh, amongst even our peers so that uh, we also don't, uh, you know, get into a severe kind of a digital live stream. Right. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, what was very important from Rishi's, you know, he said it was a didactic lecture, but I think it was a very, very practical lecture. But do we as ophthalmologists, can we spend that time, that chair time with our patient of dry eye, with a workup of dry eye after being done? Do you think a good idea would be a dry eye clinic or a, a computer vision um, syndrome clinic, something that separates the, these patients from the dry eye patients, from the other patients, your cataract patients, refractive patients, and retina patients, and give them what is required of them. So Sonu, uh, you have a huge cataract and refractive practice. What do you do for these patients? Do they go through all the protocols, indirect ophthalmoscopy and this and that, and then you finally say you have dry eye, and then you spend just two minutes. Is that so, or do you would you like to segregate? Yeah. So answering point wise, I will first congratulate Rishi for that wonderful talk. And I would recommend Partha that this whole talk can be imbibed into a flyer and which can be issued by the AIOS as a public interest for this digital live stream. I think the presentation itself speaks of the content. And I think that can be a, a wonderful flyer which can be released. Secondly, yes, in our practice, we, we have a dry eye clinic, but nothing dedicated to the digital eye strain or the a CVS kind of clinic, but yes, uh, one in 10 patients usually who uh, visit our refraction clinic usually are those uh, who have been working in corporates or the young, uh, the tech friendly people. And these all have been for the last two years during this COVID era have been suffering as we all uh, within us have been. So I think it's a great idea with the change in the, the new normals I think we would uh, be, uh, you know, uh, where uh, we would be addressing all these issues, maybe through uh, the uh, far reach programs uh, of our society where uh, we can address right at their corporate level where they have been working and, you know, uh, change in their lifestyles and a little knowledge about uh, the uh, eye exercises as Rishi rightly pointed out and the eye care and maybe some uh, at our own clinics dedicatedly uh, these CVS clinics might help uh, the uh, upcoming generation uh, for all this. 
So Patha, uh, yeah. uh, I think uh, that point that you mentioned is uh, very true that we need to look at these patients specifically, but what's changed at least over the last three or four years is I'm seeing many more people who are not directly involved with using computers professionally, who are now coming in with these complaints. Uh, the housewives, the older ladies, they're spending so much time on their mobiles and on these other tabs and, and this thing that they're coming in with these complaints the school and the college going kids. So their avenues of recreation, their avenues of information, everything is now coming from a screen. So they have no uh, contact with the outside world. They you know, do their schools online and then they do their homework online. They do their research online. And then they now do their, uh, their recreational activity online. So they suddenly are now looking at hours and hours of screen use and they're coming in with complaints like this. So one never used to see dry eye in young kids. And we are seeing that now. And so that is a, a cause for worry as well. Uh, not only that, Rishi, also the follow-ups that they would require, the multiple follow-ups they would require for the same ailment. So this is what uh, I think, Mehpal sir, what would you comment on this? That do we, should we have a dry eye clinic dedicated to these computer vision syndrome problems? So that uh, the fallibility is there, the specific, the specific requirement is there, and the patient doesn't have to wait all that time, you know, in an OPD and uh, get his worth of whatever treatment is required. See, I personally feel that the digital era has come to stay and it is going to explode further. And uh, as uh, Rishi rightly pointed out, uh, the de uh, device-related uh, dry eye or uh, the computer vision syndrome, that's going to increase. Uh, it is imperative that we need to educate the people. The other thing that is also happening is the environmental pollution. So that is the second thing which is causing a great increase. And the, suddenly the number of patients who are having these symptoms have come. And maybe uh, the one other thing that is escaping our mind is that there is definitely an increase in the number of patients who are coming with the sudden uh, development of myopia to us. Uh, immediately post uh, uh, the uh, lockdown or whatever it is because of the uh, classes and everything, the, the myopia is tending to increase also. So that is another thing that is happening. Uh, dry eye is going to be something which requires chair time and you have to work whether the uh, your location has enough time for that and that could be something like a refraction clinic you could have possibly a dry eye clinic and uh, with the new gadgets and the new devices and the diagnosis that is coming in uh, it is going to be i suppose a gratifying thing it won't be as exponentially great as a as a surgical clinic or anything like that as a surgery center but I think dry eye is uh, uh, gaining uh, significance and there are a lot of people who are uh, uh, who are benefiting from the treatment. So dry eye clinic uh, is something uh, I still remember again, I'll wish to go back to uh, Professor Madan Mohan that he had started uh, o, uh, OSD, OSD clinic. That was an ocular surface uh, disease clinic, which um, I was given to handle at that particular time. So this is way back I'm talking about uh, in 1990, uh, sorry, in 1989, uh, 90, that an ocular surface disorder clinic was started by him. So uh, that is the time when things were starting to come up. And uh, it is the foresight of people that this is uh, something that's going to gain importance. But now I think it is really becoming uh, uh, a household kind of a thing. And majority of the interviews that I have given to TV channels or to other places has been on computer vision syndrome, because that's something and the a uh, number of patients going coming in with uh, an increase in myopia. So, uh, part of I think uh, it is going to be something that we need to uh, kind of work on and uh, maybe have, uh, as Sonu also said, uh, to tell simple things to the patients or to the normal general public that this is what needs to be done. Right. Dr. Parma, what, I, what I feel is that, uh, you know, it's time now that we have to give due importance to the surface disorder and dry eye, actually. And, and in our routine practice, in our day-to-day -day evaluation, because the number of cases are increasing. It's not that they come with a specific complaint that they are having, uh, you know, they, they have increased, uh, uh, you know, screen time and, that, and that's why they are having problems. Rather, they will come up with some other problem. Maybe somebody will come, with, come up with cataract, blurring of vision or uh, other things. Somebody not having significant cataract, still having blurring of vision because of, uh, you know, um, uh, surface dryness. So, we have to incorporate, uh, you know, dry eye workup in our routine uh, uh, workup of the patient. 
because number of cases with poor ocular surface or with symptomatic uh, these digital eye strain is uh, has really increased and it's definitely going to stay as my pastor was telling and we all know that the digital era is here and it's going to stay so uh, that has to be incorporated in our day in our day to day practice i think the basic assessment of a dry eye and an ocular surface should become as important as doing the vision or the pressures or looking at the cup disc ratio you know those are the things we automatically do uh, but uh, it's surprising that uh, uh, one doesn't actually look at the surface one looks through it uh, and and uh, that uh, to my mind at least now uh, especially is uh, uh, is not really what is required one really needs to come back and work and look on the surface and act the surface so but one thing uh, partha i'll just uh, wish to say is again uh, going back to old time the most frequently written medicine by us 20 years ago was an astringent uh, we we used to write mesol or andre or some nepozoline kind of a situation and suddenly we have gone to the other side because obviously there was a best diagnosis or a wrong diagnosis ke any scratchy red eye you uh, give a, a astringent and a anti histaminic uh, combination that was there and now suddenly you see that the maximum number of prescriptions that we are writing is for lubricant eye drops <laughs> so <laughs> see how things have changed over 20 30 years <laughs> Uh, uh, for a quick comment, so we run uh, ocular surface and dry clinic every day at LVP. Uh, so that is just for surface and uh, dry patients. And off late post lockdown, the number of patients with CVS have been enormously growing. On the software front, uh, people who are free towards the weekends, so those days are just crowded with. uh people from so i this is really uh, something very alarming and uh, like uh, initially i would just have three four patients with cvs nowadays i at least in an opd i have at least 10 15 patients so the first time i see them in the clinic i explain them screen time measures and warm compresses give them a slightly extra time and then i don't i just tell them warm compresses on follow up so i just Uh, i thought that's the best way to utilize so the first time i see them i explain give them that chair time and subsequently i i hope that they remember and then they fall okay so let's have our last presentation and that's by anindo kishor mm-hmm. mazumdar uh, anindo is a uvia specialist and very passionate about this sub- subject uh, anindo please is my screen is visible sir am yes. i audible yes sure sure good evening to everybody all the esteem speakers and the esteem panelist and my heartfelt regards to aios and the scientific committee for giving me the opportunity to share my talk in this particular platform uh, i am not a dry eye specialist so i am little nervous and scared to give my talk in front of so many esteem dry eye specialist my apologies for if i am doing any wrong in assessing the fear film or something can we give your inputs i have neil financial interests Uh, i'm coming to the case a 26 year old female presented to my opd with a sudden onset dimness of vision in the right eye on examination her best eye is visual acuity was pl only with a relative afferent pupillary defect in the right eye and left eye was normal for the age uh, her right eye showing a grade 2 eso reaction with a significant vitreous cells and an occlusive retinal vasculopathy with a gross capillary non perfusion areas and a pale disc with a normal fundus in the left eye she had a fever of uh, she had a history of fever multiple joint pain loss of weight loss of appetite her investigation revealed a low hemoglobin with an increased creatinine increased tsr anti ds antibody anti ds dna antibody positive preliminary examination had been cast with microhematuria renal biopsy revealed a glomerular sclerosis so we dealt with a patient of systemic lupus with nephropathy We treated the patient along with a rheumatologist. Rheumatologist studied the patient with an IV cyclophosphamide intravenous methyl prednisolone along with an immunosuppressive therapy. Which, and we started treating the patient with topical steroid and cyclopregic along with a fundus fluorescein angiography guided pan retinal photocorrelation. She had two to three recurrences in a year uh, in uveitis. and developed a chronic uveitis her left eye was untouched by any inflammatory process 
Gradually, she complained of redness, watering, foreign body sensation. This was the fundus photograph of the right eye. He was showing a pale disc with sclerosis vessel and scattered hemorrhages. This is the fundus fluorescent angiography of the right eye, showing a gross capillary non perfusion areas. And this was a post PRP photograph of the right eye. This was the antecedent photograph of the right eye, showing evidence of chronic inflammation in the form of a broken synechia. This was the tear film assessment under the slit lamp, showing a lower tear meniscus height. Uh, very unstable tear film along with the tear debris. So I diagnosed uh, to be a case of the dry eye and I was compelled to send this patient to my cornea colleagues. Coming to my next case, a 20 years old, 28 years old male patient presented with a history of recurrent TVITs in the right eye. He was complaining of pain, redness and foreign body sensation in the right eye. His prescribed facial activity was 6, 12 and 6 while left eye was normal. On examination, he had a tender sterile nodule just adjacent to the inferior limbus and an adjacent delin like interdiction. He was found to be an anti nuclear antibody positive. This is a right eye color photograph showing a paralimbal tender in the nodule. On magnification, we can appreciate a social like in the depression just adjacent to the nodule. This was the fluorescent staining pattern of the right eye. For the left eye, the patient was completely asymptomatic. But the fluorescent staining pattern of the left eye can be showing this much of irregularities. So I suspected dry eye and sent the patient to the dry eye clinic. If you look at the literature, we see that a systemic lupus is a chronic multi-system autoimmune disease which involves skin, heart, kidney, brain, eye, blood, and lymphatic system, literally any system of the body. The incidence is almost 1,300 in one lakh patients, more seen in women. It's an autoimmune process where the body tissues are destroyed by autoantibodies against the components of the nuclei of a cell. The immune complex deposition mediated changes mainly plays a pivotal role in the pathogenesis, as well for eye as well, with the immune complex deposition in the blood vessels of conjunctiva, sclera, retina, choroid, and the basement membrane of the ciliary body and cornea, leading to vasculitis and thrombosis. The ocular involvement is seen almost one third of the patients with SLE in the form of lead dermatitis, keratitis, scleritis, secondary Jogan syndrome, dry eye, retinal and choroidal vascular lesions, and neuroophthalmic complications. Coming to my next case, a 32 years old male presented to my OPD with an alternate unilateral severe non granulomatous alveitis. On examination, he had fibrin reaction in the right eye, having a characteristic postural difficulty, imaging shows. So imaging revealed sclerosis of the bilateral sacroiliac joint. It was found to be an one positive disease. Actually, this spectrum is known as ankylosing spondylitis, presenting with a recurrent deviitis. In subsequent vis visits, he developed irritation and burning sensation. This was the antecedent photograph of the right eye and the left eye. This was the fluorescent staining pattern of the right eye, showing a low tear meniscus height, very low tear breakup time and tear debris, whereas the left eye showing similar kind of picture with a very low tear meniscus height and an untear film instability as well as tear debris. So I suspected dry eye and sent the patient to my cornea colleagues. If you look at the literature, the dry eye is common in ankylosis spondylitis patients due to their tear film instability. The study revealed that there are either elevated levels of bublet cell loss or a squamous metaplasia leading to conjunctival, um, squamous met metaplasia of the conjunctival epithelium leading to this instability. Also, the prolonged use of topical steroids, insects, and different types of topicals along with preservatives causes surface toxicity. Uh, there are list of surface uh, uh, preservatives. These are first generation preservatives. These are very toxic to the surface. The second generation preservatives relatively less toxic to the surface. They are a list of uh, newer generation preservatives. They decompose to less toxic substance like chloride and water on contact with the ocular surface and tears. So uh, they are relatively less toxic to the surface. The best is the unpreserved solutions, uh, causes least toxicity, but they are actually expensive. Coming to my next case, a 23 year old female presented to us with a redness, pain, and dimness of vision for two months. For both eyes, she has been diagnosed with a case of TVIT for six years. 
and diagnosed as a case of sarcoidosis. Her base connective visual acuity in the right eye was 6 by 24 N6 and left eye was 66 N6. This was the anterior segment of the photograph. This is a very, very angry eye. Patient was extremely symptomatic or is a diffuse congestion of the tall, deep episcleral vessels with the scleral edema, multiple in the nodules. There are even corneal scars and uh, hypopion of almost two millimeter. This is a different segment in the photograph of the right eye. And this, this fundus was also, uh, the right eye was very the hazy. There was vitreous cells in both the eyes. So we made a provisional diagnosis of a sclerokeratoid uveitis in the right eye and left eye, having an intermediate uveitis. On investigation, her complete blood count was normal. All basic collagen vascular workups was negative. The tuberculin skin test as well as the IGRA was positive for uh, screening TB. Serum ACE was normal. We rule out infection by doing an AC tap. PCR came negative for MTB panfungal acid as well as bacterial genome. We did an HSCT chest. We revealed a parenchyma infiltrate with fibrotic strands and lymph node in the mediastinum, P cardinal, and hyaline lymph node. On in 2011, the cervical lymph nodal biopsy was showing a evidence of the granuloma in the background of a lymphoid cells. A probable diagnosis of sarcoidosis was made, and patient received steroid for one year. And this time in 2013, we uh, saw the patient first. Pulmonologist made a diag um, diagnosis of latent tuberculosis and started the patient on antitubercular therapy along with uh, oral steroid, topical steroid, cyclopragic, and topical NSAID. Patient responded, pain was reduced, all the reactions were reduced. In two months, there was active separation of steroids again. This was the first recurrence in the photograph. We can the, appreciate this diffuse congestion, sectoral congestion with the scleral edema. Patient was symptomatic with a severe pain. There is evidence of scleral thinning as well. We started the patient on azathioprine. Four months after starting the azathioprine, patient stopped the therapy, continued with the low dose steroid. Even after four months, patient come, come back, came back with a very severe tumor recurrence. At this time, the pain was not combated with steroid and azathioprine. We put the patient on intravenous methylprednisolone. And this was the presenting in the picture at that time. We can appreciate the deeper scleral condition. Patient was comfortable with post uh, with methylprednisolone, we completed the ATD, stable for four months. Again, after four months, there were persistent focus of non necrotizing steroiditis and pain was classically increasing at night. So we are dealing with a very decalcitrant type type of uh, steroiditis. We got a little confused with what we miss here. We can appreciate a very diffuse spell in the congestion along with activity. So we again... Uh, Went back to the pulmonologist and sit back with the rheumatologist as well. We discussed the case. We did the HSCT. There was cardiomegaly and mediastinal thickening. Again, we stick to the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. We put the patient on oral steroid, subcutaneous methotrexate along with doxycycline and uh, HCQS. Patient gradually stabilized with subcutaneous methotrexate over one year time. Right eye cataract surgery was to be done and patient was maintained on methotrexate for one year. In uh, COVID era, there was a gap in follow-up. So patient a few months back, presented with an acute onset presentation with a scleral melt in the right eye. We referred the patient urgently to the surface clinic, underwent scleral patch graft under steroid and immunosuppressive cover. And this is two months post up this picture where the full surface got epithelized, but patient is complaining of pain and irritation. So let us see how is the fluorescent staining pattern of the right eye. This was the fluorescent staining pattern of the right eye. You can easily appreciate the diffuse staining. Uh, the, Break of the time was with the low, and patient hardly can open up the eyes in, in a bright light. So we refer back the patient to the surface clinic for her dry eye management. The, the association of scleritis in the system, it involves the vessels by resulting in deposition of circulating immune complexes in the superficial and deeper epistral in the vessels, which ultimately results in the shutdown of the Episcleral in the vascular in the bed, resulting in sloughing of necrosis and complications. Uh, in systemic association list, there are a plethora of uh, diseases starting from rheumatoid arthritis to sarcoidosis. I'm not uh, reading it, as we all know, and most of the diseases are primarily associated with dry eye. So, coming to the sarcoidosis and dry eye, sarcoidosis is a disease which can affect literally any uh, system of the eye. 
um, surface, it has so many involvements, starting from conjunctiva to epistera to cornea to the lacrimal in the glands, leading to dry eye disease. Coming to my last case, is a six years old male presented to us with a chronic uveitis with hypertension and complicated cataract. So she, he was diagnosed with a case of juvenile idiopathic arthritis in a very early age and on disease modifiers like methotrexate and HCQS under the supervision of a rheumatologist. He underwent lensectomy, vitrectomy, and silicone oil injections and the GA. Patient remains symptomatic for a very long time. This is the anterior segment of the photograph. We can appreciate a uh, band shape between the keratopathy uh, and an aphrychia. This is the staining in the pattern of the both the eyes. This is the patient was very symptomatic. You couldn't take the left eye in the video. The right eye is showing a significant the TFL meniscus low height along with the TFL low breakup time and TFL debris. So looking at the literature, GIA again is the commonest systemic association of uveitis in childhood. It is usually insidious in onset, presented in one to five years' time. It presents with a chronic bilateral non granulomatous type of uveitis. Acute onset disease can be seen in an HLA-B27 positive group. Diagnosis is usually based on anti antibody, the age of onset, and duration of the pain and arthritis. The early onset disease, classically uh, ANA positive oligoarticular oligo GIA, is the highest association and risk of developing chronic arthritis. GIA is generally a diagnosis of exclusion from other causes of chronic arthritis. Usually, the arthritis precedes the uveitis, but uveitis could be the presenting case. Right? If the cases are asymptomatic, they are generally diagnosed with late and coming up with a poor visual. The large number of cases are generally the diagnosis in idiopathic uveitis that requires a very thorough follow-up with the rheumatologist and a detailed tailored investigation and a careful combined approach. So my take-home message is, devil is there, but that requires a clinical suspicion as well as management. The chronic disease needs more monitoring of the ocular surface. We never afford to overlook any clinical surface sign. We need timely referral of the patient to the specialist to prevent further complications and practice of preservative free operations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Onindo. And uh, that was a very, very elaborate discussion. In fact, uh, we put you at the end because you are dealing with two devils. <laughs> the, the devil of the uvea itself, uveitis itself, and the devil of the dry eye. So, uh, Chitra, any comments you would have? Uh, <clears throat> that was a wonderful talk. Uh... Uh, really, I actually was planning to exit, but I just got caught up with uh, all that you said. So it goes without saying that uh, all that you said is very valuable and uh, we need to always be on lookout for a dry status and treat them with as much vigor, uh, along with all those uh, other chronic treatments which are needed for uveitis. I don't think uh, there's more to add on that. It is... Uh, the difficulty of the uveitis, and especially as you said about the metaplasia changes that take place, the goblet cells becoming totally you know, defunct, it makes it even more difficult for a chronic uveitis patient to uh, for a dry eye treatment, is that not? Uh, Rishi, um, uh, you would have any comments on this? Um, no, I think it's a very good talk and I think he's highlighted a few points uh, about the importance of uh, the ocular surface. Now, these patients are going to be on chronic therapy. Almost all the medicines that we're going to use are going to have preservatives. They're going to have uh, significant frequencies as well because if there's intraocular inflammation and then the use of NSAIDs, which would be imperative in, uh, in uh, deeper uh, inflammations of the eyeball is actually bad news for the surface. So uh, NSAIDs, which would otherwise not be used, like we don't use NSAIDs at all uh, for our uh, dry eye patients. Uh, so, but here you don't have a choice. Uh, so you're going to be dealing with the, you know, the ketorolax and the diclofenacs and the yes. fluid going on to the ocular surface. So maybe 
Dr. Nindya could tell us about how he would uh, sort of, you know, um, compromise these two uh, approaches. Uh, and would he rather use uh, preservative-free steroids? Uh, the only preservative-free Ketorolac that was available has also been withdrawn now, uh, which I think was Acular, uh, which used to come in that uh, little strip. So uh, I would be keen to hear from him because I'm sure he's got many more, ex much more experience than we do. Uh, I think uh, they have uh, are now a lot on to immunosuppressives and biologics and those kind of treatments that mm -hmm. uh, I don't think NSAIDs they'd be using much in uvia cases at all, I think. Maybe a comprehensive ophthalmologist might use, but a uvia specialist would have entirely, they might be using steroid drops at the most, which could uh, add, but I think the other medications would. No, I think uh, the the still form, uh, still form um, the treatment, even when the active uveitis has subsided, you know, you go on putting NSAs for at least three months so that the inflammation doesn't come back easier. Um, Aninda, you, you comment on that. Yes, sir. Means the topical NS, NSAIDs has a very good role in uh, controlling or the maintenance of the inflammatory activity at, at the baseline. And it has been uh, so many of the publications also have for the use of uh, different kinds of topicals in the NSAID. But the, it's a double edged sword. Like if we lose the grip of the inflammatory disease, we'll say uh, inflammatory CM. Uh, you, you can inject or you can have a system uh, medication or an immunosuppressive, which is taking care of the disease process itself. But along with that, a topical insect is always contributory in reducing the risk of recurrence of those inflammatory CMAs. In those cases, we really have to continue with the topical insect. But along with that, we also have a close monitoring of the ocular surface, whether we are lining up with any kind of toxicity. Naren, any short comments and before we end? Sonu and uh, KP is also there. Any short comments from any of you? Uh, uh, I, I believe that I think def definitely dry eye workup is extremely, extremely important. Yeah. Always look at the eyelids, look at the eyelashes. That, that is, I think, you know, we need to go step by step. I mean, what happens in medical school, we are taught, then over time we just forget it and we just simply go ahead. I think that is not to be forgotten. It is very important to look at every part before we go inside and look inside. And uh, because half the clues are right there, uh, bang on your face and it is easily missed out. When the patient complains post-surgery, they then you start looking for it. So I feel uh, that is uh, that is a key message that every surgeon has been telling uh, in every uh, everyone uh, talk. I feel that is the take home message. Right. Thank you. Thank Sonu, you. KP. Okay. Everything has been said. <laughs> Whatever has been said, as everything has been said, right? So I think thank you very much. Uh, thanks for, to all of you, to the speakers, to the panelists, and it's been a very nice discussion. Uh, I'm sure the, the Facebook numbers are going up. <laughs> I was just looking at that. And it's been a very good discussion with all the multi-specialities involved. And uh, thank you very much for being with us and from the whole team of uh, Scientific Committee. Thanks, Rishi. Thanks, Chitra. Thanks, Anindo. Thanks, uh, Narin. And, thank, you, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Good night. Thanks a lot, Partha. Thank you.